I get sleep paralysis, and it's always the same thing. A pair of young twins would appear. One was in a little dress and pigtails, the other with suspenders and slacks. They never talked, let alone gave me their names, so I called them Tammy and Tucker. They had black skin. Not like African-American skin, but black as the night, barely more than a living shadow, with yellow eyes that flickered. The way that they moved was just freaky. They changed positions with my every blink, like a weeping angel, or SCP-173. For the first hour, or five blinks after I woke up, there was nothing but the darkness of my room. Then my vision would get slightly lighter, like I had an invisible nightlight that just lit up my whole room. On the next blink, my closet door would open, with a little clawed hand peeping out like it had been in the middle of clawing its way out of the dark depths of my closet. On the next, a hand would appear on the floor under my bed, and the one in my closet would be a full arm. My bed had about a foot of space under it, so I imagine a small child would have no trouble fitting underneath. On the next blink, the hand under my bed would be flipped, frozen in time in the middle of clawing at my bed sheets, and I would see Tammy's head poking out of my closet, staring at me. On the next blink, I would see Tucker's head poking out of the underside of my bed, and Tammy would have moved onto the ceiling, on all fours, her head broken around, just to stare at me. And then, on the next blink, Tucker's head would be upright, his chin resting on my bed, staring at me with his flickering eyes, and Tammy would be closer. On the next, Tucker would be at the foot of my bed, on his knees, staring at me, and I would be able to feel his weight. Tammy would be in the middle of my room. On the next, Tucker would be sitting on my thighs and Tammy would be at my bedside. And on the final blink, I would see their mouths open almost as wide as their heads, revealing rows upon rows of pearly white teeth curved like daggers, ready to sink into my flesh, so close to me that I could feel their breath, cold as ice on my face. Then, with the last blink, they would be gone. No traces of them left, except for the bruises that appeared on my legs the following morning. One of the many reasons I would have trouble falling asleep is that once the paralysis started, my eyes wouldn't allow me to surpass the amount of time that the twins wanted me for, and I couldn't just rapidly blink for them to go away. It was as though my eyes were being held open against my will. Once the paralysis wore off, about four blinks after the twins left, I wouldn't be able to make a sound until I drifted off to sleep. Myself and a few friends go on a road trip every summer to visit haunted places. In 2018, we stayed at a haunted hotel in the northeastern United States and had to sign a safety waiver just to stay there. It was a small country hotel and the only other party had canceled, so we had the place to ourselves with our tour guide. We had a spirit box type of device, which I've been skeptical of, but we all carried on conversations. There was a moment where I heard my name through the box, when I had never said my name, and even said my full name. I prefer a shortened version. We spent a lot of time upstairs in a room where the quote-unquote ladies of the night would sleep, and I was prohibited from sitting on the bed by a spirit that was allegedly the lady's bodyguard. I sat down only for a few seconds, and as soon as I stood, the bed lifted up and dropped, scaring the hell out of me, and at least one of my friends witnessed this. We went upstairs to an unfinished floor that was under renovation. 
there was an old ornate chair that was used by a notorious Irish Mafia hitman that stayed at the hotel frequently. We went in a circle saying our names to see if the spirit, Joe, would let one of us sit in the chair. I said mine, and a light that we were using started to flicker like crazy. This is especially odd because I have red hair, and as far as I know, I was the only one in our group of Irish descent. Our guide asked if he was sure that he wanted me to sit there, and he replied, F yeah, through the box. I took the invitation and sat in the chair, and oddly enough, I felt some kind of strange power surge through me. I eventually stood and thanked Joe, and from the spirit box I heard, You're welcome. Later that night is when the real event happened. Our guide said, Now, I don't normally do this, but since there are only four of you, I'd like to take you down to the morgue. It wasn't so much of a morgue, but it was stone walls and a dirt floor, and it was cold as hell. We were in a corner of the room when our guide said, I don't want to scare you, but there's something standing right behind you. I saw a shadow on the wall, but it was cast by my friend B. That's when B moved to the side, and there was another shadow underneath his. It was taller than anyone in the room, and gave off an intimidating presence. I looked back, and saw no one standing in front of the light source, and when I looked back again, there was no shadow. I've always been skeptical, but believed in the supernatural to a degree. Believe me when I say that basement had something seriously dark down there. Something evil. I have never felt so vulnerable in my life. The whole night, we felt like we were being watched and could hear footsteps around the hotel. I'd love to go back and get some more evidence someday. I've done paranormal investigations for a few years now, but that one night stay at that hotel was enough to completely convince me. There is definitely something beyond death, and perhaps the most terrifying part? Not everything on that side is friendly. I've had a few unexplained experiences over the decades, but the Gold Hill Hotel is my favorite spooky tale. I was staying the weekend at the hotel with friends and my then boyfriend. It was a really memorable weekend because it was the Christmas holiday season and the hotel was decked out. We were all drinking and it was quite festive. There was a female jazz singer from San Francisco who was staying at the hotel and who played carols on the piano. My boyfriend went up to the room before me and passed out drunk in the bed. I followed not long after. Later that night, I awoke suddenly to someone jerking the blankets off of me. It was the force of the jerk on the blankets that woke me up. I immediately looked over at my snoring, drunk boyfriend sleeping on his side, and then down at the blankets themselves. They had been pulled down to my waist, and down off of him. I slowly pulled them back up and curled up next to him. I slept very little the rest of the night. The next day, I asked him if he recalled anything unusual, but he didn't, and poo-pooed my experience. Later, I found out that we were staying in one of the rooms that visitors commonly reported having blankets pulled off of them. I can't recall the specifics of the ghost that actually haunts the room, but I sure do remember that moment when the blankets were laying down below my waist and pulled off of my boyfriend and realizing that maybe we weren't alone in our room. This happened to me when I was in high school. I was around 15, 16 years old, so it was around 2005 or 2006. Now, for context, this happened in France in a medium-sized city. I had to take one bus and one tram, tramway, to get to my high school. It was about 45 minutes to a one-hour trip. Usually classes start at 8.15 a.m. and the tram would be packed up with people as my high school was located next to the university and another high school. But that day my class started at 10 a.m. 
As a result, the tram was practically empty, which meant that I could get a seat for once. There was no seat by my side, only one seat in front of me. So I was sitting there listening to my music when a man sat down in front of me. He quickly started talking to me. I honestly don't remember what he was saying, but I was trying not to be rude as he seemed to have some sort of mild mental disability. But very quickly, he started asking me out. Remember, I was underage, and I definitely looked my age. He wondered if I wanted to go and get a drink. I said that I couldn't, that I had to go to class. He was very persistent. At some point, he took out his wallet and offered me money. I remember him saying something like, If it's about money, don't worry about it. He pulled out about 200 in cash. I was already creeped out by now and couldn't wait to get out of that tram, but I was also too shy to get out and sit somewhere else. That's when he pulled out a piece of paper. He was holding it in the air and I remember him doing a notion with his head like, look at this type of motion. It was an article from a newspaper that he had cut and kept inside of his wallet. I only had a few seconds to read what the article was about. All I had time to see was that something had happened to a woman. She had been assaulted. But that's it. That's all I had time to read before he put it back away. Now, as if this wasn't creepy enough, he had a giant smile on his face, like he was proud of himself, that type of smile. Whether he knew that woman, or if this was a random article, he for some reason decided to keep with him at all times. It's just extremely unsettling. Not only that, but showing it to a random girl? Why? The piece of paper itself looked like it's been in his wallet for some time. It was a little torn, but definitely wasn't old. I eventually arrived at my stop. He kept insisting on meeting again. I denied and quickly walked to my school. After that, I saw him again, once, a few days later. This time, the tram was packed again, but I still felt the need to hide behind the people surrounding me, just in case he would see me and come talk to me again. The second time I saw him was maybe two or three years after. He looked exactly the same. I recognized him instantly. He was walking in the streets of the city and didn't see me. I realized I didn't give a physical description of the man, so here it is. He was average height, dark brown hair on the chubby side. He had glasses on, and the three times I saw him, he was always carrying a big backpack. The exact same military green backpack and the same jacket. I want to preface this by saying that I generally consider myself to be a rather skeptical person and have written off most of cryptozoology and paranormal stuff as straight up bunk until this event. I try to see if there's a realistic reasoning behind most encounters and stories, if that makes sense. Now, let's get to the meat and potatoes of this story. It was the late summer of 2005 in Northeast Ohio. I was heading into my junior year of high school. I was spending the night over at my best friend's house and we decided for the hell of it to just go crash outside for the night with just sleeping bags. It was a peaceful enough evening. The weather was a nice, balmy, kind of warm and the air rang with the pleasant symphony of crickets and far-off spring peepers. Skies couldn't have been more clear, as it was that special sort of feeling in the air where you were far enough away from the last time it rained that the air didn't feel heavy anymore, and actually felt inviting instead of humid and miserable. This was as close to a picturesque summer evening as you could get. Everything was blanketed in the dark blue elegance of the evening light. 
Falling asleep was easy enough. This was a year that mosquitoes were remarkably in pretty low numbers, making sleeping unprotected with just a sleeping bag simple for once. Eventually, as bad luck would have it, I had to answer the call of nature, so I was roused from sleep to do so. My buddy's yard was a fairly large-sized one, with an area of woods bordering most of it. After finishing, I staggered back over to my sleeping bag, and noticed that my friend was not in his. We were staged a few feet apart in case a bear came and got someone in the middle of the night or something. It would leave enough time for the other one to run to safety. You know, bro stuff. In any case, I catch him in my peripheral vision just kind of standing along the side of a shed that was in his yard. I wasn't kidding when I said that this night was picturesque. The sky was so unnaturally clear that the starlight and what little of the crescent moon we had left led to quite a bit of light despite being in the dead of the night itself. However, the area where we chose to pee, with the shed included, happened to be nestled along the part of the yard that was the thickest with trees, leading to a large portion of the yard still being under heavy shadow. Kind of funny to think about, isn't it? Having a well-defined area of shade in the dead of night when you expect everything to be dark. Oh, have I mentioned that at this point it was also suspiciously quiet? The idyllic chirping of the frogs and crickets that had earlier ushered me to sleep was now nowhere to be heard. I hadn't realized it when I first woke up to do my business, but it was quiet the whole time since I had woken up. Honestly, the fact that it was so quiet may have been why I woke up in the first place, on top of answering nature's call. Focusing my attention back on my friend, I'm noticing that he's still standing by the shed. He was around the corner away from me, so I had to approach him from behind, and thankfully it seemed he was going to be done using the bathroom. And thankfully it seemed he was done going to the bathroom as his pants were up. Hey. What are you doing just standing around there? I ask as I circle around and approach to his left. I didn't even need to wait for an answer before I immediately saw what had him frozen. Roughly about 30 feet away, hidden among the thickest area of forest in the yard, way back behind the shed, it stood. I'm not the greatest with words. So please bear with me as I try my best to describe what befell my eyes. This creature was perhaps a few inches taller than myself, and I was six foot at the time. However, that's where the similarities end. It stood on two legs with a hunched posture, as it appeared to have had its shoulders raised up with its head leaning slightly forward. It had arms, but the forearms were a bit longer than the upper arms, culminating into sickly-looking hands ending in long points, almost like claws. Though bathed in starlight and shadow, I could discern the skin of the beast was about a dark blue, dark grayish color. The head itself was mostly obscured by the shadows, but retained a general humanoid appearance. I couldn't make out a mouth or a jaw. But the most unnerving thing about it was that its eyes glowed red. Well, perhaps glowed is a bit of a sensationalist term. It actually looked more like the red eye effect from old photos. However, it definitely illuminated the area immediately around the eye sockets. So perhaps illuminate is the better term. This creature was so sickeningly frail and thin in build that there was no way it could have been a neighbor fucking with us, as it didn't even seem physically possible for something so thin to even be able to support weight on such a frame. And then it started moving. At this point, my fight-or-flight response told me to go screw myself, and I stood frozen in fear, just like my friend. 
The beast, already a horrific bastardization of the human form, now grotesquely bobbed its body up and down, as if attempting to take off in flight. I didn't notice it before, but there appeared to be a sort of cape behind its back. Though I say cape, it appeared to be of a ragged, fleshy texture, as if the skin on its back was flayed off and was dragging behind its arms. This sickening flesh cape waved with each flap of its arms, giving the illusion of wings. But that wasn't even the worst part. It emitted a noise. This wasn't a growl, or a roar, or even a scream. The sound it made was akin to a raspy inhale, like someone deeply out of breath. However, it still wasn't quite like that. There was like a sort of reverb to its breathing. It echoed quietly, yet still managed to be one of those sounds that you feel in your bones, each graveling breath raking its claws into your very soul as you're already frozen in horror. This dance felt like it went on for hours, but in reality it was only a few brief moments that passed. Our bodies finally made enough adrenaline that we were able to bolt and sprint to his house. We talked about it a few days later, but after a point, just didn't feel like reliving it anymore. Until we researched what cryptids were and settled on the idea we came across, and decided that people would think we were just full of it, and decided to not bother talking about it at all. To this day, I still don't know what I encountered. But this experience has subconsciously kept me terrified of being in wooded areas after dark for all these years. In fact, last weekend my wife and kids and I were camping at a state campground, and it was the first time I had been outside at night in the woods since that day, and I was scared all night long. Thankfully nothing happened, and we had a nice weekend but it's crazy that this experience has affected me for so long. My wife was the only other person I shared this experience with, and at first she laughed it off, thinking I was kidding, until she saw how solemn that I got when I talked about it, and could see that it clearly was not a joke to me. She then confided in me that she's experienced her own paranormal things, so that's fun too. Superficially, I would say it resembled what people have described as the Mothman, but I never actually saw it take flight, and the eyes didn't glow nearly as bright as reports made it out to be. Also, the wings only looked like wings when it was flapping its arms, and I doubt that it could have actually flown with those raggedy skin flaps. But I'm definitely not going to be trying to figure it out. The only other guess was some kind of crawler, maybe. But I never saw it make any other action, aside from the bobbing and arm waving. In 2001, I was big into ghost hunting. I was looking online for a haunted weekend road trip destination and came across the Jefferson Hotel in Jefferson, Texas. About the only thing it said was that room 19 was quote unquote, uninhabitable. Now that really piqued my interest, so I called them up and asked if it was true. The lady at the front desk laughed and just said no, we booked that room all the time. So I reserved it. I was so excited, but didn't really think that anything would happen. I'd been to several supposedly haunted hotels and B&Bs and had no results. Now, I'm not sensitive like some people. I always hear people say, I felt like someone was watching me. I have no idea what that means. The only thing I noticed when I walked in the room was a faint musky smell of an old fashioned perfume. I set up a recorder in the room and headed out to explore the town. It was like going back in time. If you live in Texas and are looking for a road trip, I highly recommend Jefferson. 
When I got back to the room, I turned off the recorder and looked out its one window to see a large bust of Thomas Jefferson in the courtyard. I then sat down on the bed to relax and watch some TV. After a bit, something caused me to look back up at the window, and I saw something. A red smudge on the glass. I frowned and got up to see what it was. I hadn't noticed any red smudges earlier. I looked closely. It was more like a streak of red in a greasy substance of some sort. Then I noticed more streaks, and then more. I gradually began to realize that these were letters. My heart began to race as I backed up to take it all in. These streaks of red were spelling out, help me. I kind of just collapsed on the bed, my heart still racing. I knew without a doubt in my mind that those letters were not there 15 minutes earlier. I just sat in disbelief for about five minutes. Needless to say, there was not much sleep to be had that night. As I left the hotel the next morning, I was disappointed to see that there was no one behind the desk. I really needed to talk to someone. I left a note about the writing and said that I would call them on Monday. When I called, I told the woman who answered who I was and she said, hold on just a moment. She put the housekeeping lady on the phone. I asked, did you see it? She said, yes, I saw it. And then she said, just before you arrived, I raised the blinds and turned on the AC. There was no writing. And the strangest thing was when I attempted to clean it off. She said that it was like the letters had been engraved into the glass. I told her that I was freaked out and she confirmed that she was too. By the way, on the way home, I listened to the tape that I had had running in the room while I was gone. What I heard was the sound of the closet door angrily slamming several times and something shuffling around. But what really got to me was the sound of a woman sobbing. A few days ago, I started writing a script for a horror film. I was thinking about my experiences as a kid and what frightened me. The scariest thing that I remember is the first thing that came to mind, and also the most recent one that I can recall. When I was seven or eight, in the middle of summer, I woke up in the middle of the night. I thought it was because I was cold, which was uncomfortably odd because it was summer, and my bedroom is upstairs and insulated. I moved my curtain aside to see if the window was open, but it was closed tight. While I was looking at the window, I noticed a man standing in the street. The street lamp was on his back, so I couldn't see his face but he was looking toward our house. What I noticed was that he was very tall. I think now that he was probably around six foot seven. It scared the crap out of me, so I pulled the curtain over the window and used the tacks from one of my posters to tack the curtain down, since the window didn't lock. I covered my head with my covers because I knew that my dad would say it was a nightmare and give me a hug before sending me back to bed. I eventually did fall back asleep, but a few hours later, I woke up again. It was still very dark out, probably around 1 a.m. The first thing I noticed was my bedroom door was open, and I always shut my bedroom door because I'm a very private person. I got out of bed and went to go to the bathroom. I made sure as I was leaving the bathroom to close my door. Once I was done, as I was going up the stairs, I noticed that my door was open. At this point, I was pretty freaked out. I went into my room, and my heart dropped into my stomach. My bedspread was torn from my bed. The sheets were strewn across the floor. All my pictures and posters were taken off the walls, and the dresser was emptied onto my bed. I went into my sister's room because it was right across the hall. I felt even worse when I did this because she was fast asleep and all the papers had been pulled out of her desk. 
I woke her up, shaking her as hard as I could. I told her what had happened, and we both ran downstairs to my dad's room. He helped us search the house, but we didn't find anything. Nothing had been taken, and my sister and I's rooms were the only ones that had been trashed. We both slept in the living room for a few days, because it was by my dad's room, but nothing happened. So we went back to life as normal, and eventually forgot about it, until now. A few years back, I had gone out with some friends to the mountains for a camping trip. And by camping trip, I mean everybody gets drunk or high around a fire in the middle of the woods and then passes out in their trucks. I was always the youngest of the friend group, and this took place before I found my taste for mind-altering substances. I'm typically something of a skeptic, and if this had happened nowadays, I'd probably blame it on being drunk. But I was stone cold sober the whole time, which is why I feel so sure of what I saw. We're all out at the campsite, maybe 10 or 15 of us. I'm sitting on someone's tailgate smoking a cigarette when my friend, let's call him John, comes up to me clearly intoxicated. John was the one who I came out to the campsite with, and probably my closest friend out of anyone there. He asked me if I wanted to go on an adventure with him in the woods. I figured that if nothing else, I should probably go with him just to make sure that he didn't drunkenly fall over and hurt himself. Not to mention that even though I didn't drink or do any drugs back then, didn't mean that I was opposed to fun adventures into the forest. So we walked past the tree line that surrounded the campfire and into the dense trees. The moon was out and it was a pretty clear night, so although it wasn't dark, it wasn't pitch black. We came to a clearing that seemed to be made of flattish boulders and rocks. We were looking up at the night sky and John was drunk talking and I was listening and nodding along with whatever nonsense he was saying. He took a seat on one of the flatter rocks, and eventually just laid down and passed out. I tried to jostle him awake, but he just kept mumbling for me to let him rest a while. Since this is usually how John behaves when he's drinking, I complied, and figured I'd head back to the campsite and check on him again in a little bit. I go back, talk to a few people, smoke a few cigarettes, and then decide to go and check on him. Maybe ten minutes have passed. I'm walking back to the clearing where I left him and already from afar noticed that he wasn't in the same spot. I kept going, figuring that he must have gotten up and wandered off somewhere. As I'm walking, I notice a shadow in the shape of a human standing behind a shrub of sorts a few feet to my right. I stop, figuring that it was John messing with me. I said, dude, come on, let's go back to the camp. No response. Then I gave him the stereotypical, please, you're not scaring me. Still nothing. I moved closer to the shadow and noticed that I couldn't make out any distinguishable features. No shirt logo, no eyes, or any face for that matter. Just a vacuum of black that stood in the shape of a man hanging out with me in the forest. I backed away, putting it all together that it wasn't John, and I ran back to camp. I checked the truck that John and I drove out there in, and he was sleeping on the bench seat. I did a quick head count, and everyone that I had recalled being at the camp was still there. The only thing that convinces me that this was paranormal was just the sheer absence of light that this thing took the shape of. Just pure darkness. Whenever I tell this story, John always gets chills imagining that this thing was probably out there with him when he was passed out alone.
The general conclusion was that John had stumbled back while I had left him, and I just didn't notice that he had returned. Like I said, I'm a skeptic, so I always try to rationalize these things. But this is the one experience that I've had that I just can't believe was simply my eyes playing tricks on me. I've heard of shadow people, but I always thought those were just what people saw during sleep paralysis. Not out in the wilderness, and not while fully awake. I have these dreams sometimes. Sometimes they're warnings, and other times they're just odd. I started noticing that they weren't normal when I was about eight, and I started having the same dream every night. My parents were freshly divorced, and my mom had moved into this yellow house. The heater didn't work, and every window was broken. She wouldn't allow us near the windows because she was afraid we'd get cut. This house was mostly normal during the day. The buzz of the fan above the stove while mom cooks, me and my sister playing, the TV on, just seemed normal. But every night, that dream would come back. It wasn't a bad dream, just one that I really don't get. A native man, who looked like he was probably a chief based on the headdress, would walk into the house through the front door. He would look at me for a long time before opening every cabinet and drawer, and then would exit through the back door. I had this dream for a week or two before telling my mom, but I went to her one day and I said, every night I have a dream that someone opens all the drawers, cabinets, and doors, and it's really starting to creep me out. She looked at me and told me that she had woke up and had to shut every door and cabinet and drawer that morning. Then, when I was about ten, my uncle was hospitalized. All of our family was staying together in one house so that we could all help each other out. Our uncle was a big part of our lives and really kept the family together. The adults went to visit him, and all us kids stayed home with one adult who stayed behind. When they came back, they told us very little about my uncle's condition. They just said he can't wait to be back home. That night, I dreamt that I went alone to find out what had really happened. I walked into the hospital room where my uncle was and I said, Hey uncle, it's me, your niece. How are you? And he said, Who are you? I don't have any family. I don't remember them. I spent the rest of the dream trying to convince him that I was real. It smelled like hand sanitizer and old people. I woke up crying and screaming. I don't know why, but I knew it wasn't just a dream. So I asked my mom and aunt, Why did you lie to me? Uncle doesn't even remember us. They asked me how I knew. I dreamt another time that my mom was wearing all red. She was so confident and pretty, and I remember telling her in the dream that she looked really nice. And then her boyfriend came out. He started fighting with her, asking why she was wearing that slutty color. Are you cheating on me? You know I'll kill you if you do, right? Now you know what? I don't want to be with a woman that dresses like that. Have fun being single. I woke back up and she was wearing all red. I begged her to change. I said, Mom, something bad is going to happen because I remembered how much she loved him, even if I hated him. She didn't listen and a few minutes later I was hearing, Are you cheating on me? You know I'll kill you if you do, right? All over again. Things like this stopped for a while. Everything was peaceful, and I didn't read into dreams too much. Until last year, anyway. Last year, I had a strange dream that my current boyfriend was in. At the time of this dream, we were only acquaintances. We had just barely met. The dream was unlike any of the others, because I wasn't all the way asleep while I was having it, and I found that I could not move. Other things happen too, but I'll get into that later. The dream starts with me walking to the bathroom because I had to pee. Then I make the decision to leave the bathroom door open because no one is home. I have the quick thought to myself, don't leave that door open, but I ignore it. It's gotten to the point where it's time for me to clean up and wash my hands, but when I look out the door as I'm about to get up, 
I see my current boyfriend. His head is tilted to the side, and he's saying, She's here. He says it very creepily and matter-of-fact-like, but it doesn't sound like him at all. He continues and repeats himself. I say, who? Who is here? But when I engage in the conversation he's trying to have, what he says changes. He starts saying, her heart is here. At that point, across the hall from the bathroom, my bedroom door swings open to show me a little girl. But she's not a little girl at all. She took my voice. I tried calling out for everyone. My dad, my sister, the neighbors. Nothing would come out until I called for my mother. But calling for my mother was useless. She lived an hour and a half away. I woke up calling for her. I figured it was a sign to visit, but we weren't on the best terms. Anyway, around the time Halloween was supposed to be celebrated, my cats started acting really weird in my room. I started feeling uncomfortable staying in there. I couldn't breathe in there after that dream. My cats would scratch at the walls, and sometimes would hiss at my closet for no reason. On Halloween night, I couldn't sleep. I kept thinking about the dreams I was gonna have, so I took NyQuil and passed out in a record 17 minutes. I figured I'd be asleep all through the night, but I woke up at 3 a.m. I saw someone standing next to my closet. It looked like my mom, but I wasn't sure. I shut my eyes and refused to open them because I was terrified. When I woke up, without telling my mom anything about what had happened, I asked her what she had dreamt of. And she told me, I dreamt I was standing next to your closet. Something's not right about that closet. Maybe you should come visit for a while and give yourself some space from there. I want to make it very clear. I never told her anything about this closet. I didn't tell her that I saw her when she dreamt she was there. I didn't tell her about the girl. I didn't tell her about the cats. So I came to visit after about a month, around Thanksgiving. I had been sleeping in Dad's living room or going to friends to avoid my bedroom. I couldn't wait to sleep in a bed. Everything at Mom's was wonderful. We had movie night, talked about things, and just got caught up. So when I came back to Dad's, I actually hadn't slept. I was so happy to be at Mom's, I had just stayed up the whole time. So when I got back, I was pretty exhausted. I went to my room because I was feeling better about it. I turned on my nightlight, still terrified of the dark, and opened my bedroom door. I will die in a fire before I shut that door when I'm inside the room and lay down to go to sleep. Instantly, the dream took me, before I was even all the way gone. I felt someone hug me and start to kiss my neck. It felt like someone I knew, and I wasn't bothered by it. But the second I relaxed into the hug, it got tighter and tighter until I couldn't breathe. I realized my nightlight wasn't on anymore, and the faint glow from the hallway wasn't much. But it was enough for me to see the closet door open and these odd creatures come out. Short undefined. Any lines that define them were just white lines on their shadowy bodies. I felt that they were going to hurt me, and again I was terrified, but I just woke up, and then it was over. I looked over though, and I realized that my closet door was still open, and my nightlight was off, even though I had shut that door and turned the light on beforehand. I work at the front desk of a hotel, and within the last six months, we had a guest that passed away in one of our rooms. Because of this pandemic, my boss is blocked off the room, even after deep cleaning, just to be safe. Due to the hotel business not doing well, he also had a couple of rooms cut off from power, which means that none of the electronics are working for those rooms. Now, our hotel has two phones up at the front, one for external calls and the other specifically for internal lines, which are only connected to the phones in each guest room. I was having a quiet day during my shift alone. Business isn't running as normal and all the housekeepers had left for the day, and the only staff there was the maintenance guy and I. 
I get an internal phone call from one of the rooms and answer it as I usually do, and it's just static noises, along with an occasional cut-in between. Like the noise that you get when you unplug your headphones from a device. I didn't think anything of it at first, and thought that it was a guest accidentally calling the front desk, so I waited a little bit to hang up. Then I realized that the call was from the same room where the guest had passed away, and that there was no way a call could be made from that room because the phone was unplugged. I was a little bit spooked, so I asked the maintenance guy who was just chilling in the back office to go and check out the room and make sure that the power was still out. He comes back and sure enough the phone is still unplugged and he even took a picture of it. He also has a log of what rooms have power, electronics, etc. We even checked the lobby cameras to make sure that no one had gone into the rooms and there was nothing. No housekeepers went in or out of the room at all within the past week. Just as we were done checking the camera footage, I received another call from that same exact room. And this time it was silent for a good 10 seconds or so, and then the same static noise, but this time much louder. I hung up the phone so fast, a guest asked if everything was okay. I didn't tell her. I tried to think of every scientific possible way that this could have been an internal mistake, such as an outside sales call accidentally getting caught within our internal call system, but that's just impossible to begin with especially if the phone cord was not plugged in. So my story initially starts with me, an 18-year-old female, being a guitar player of six years. I started early in high school and loved to play. My guitar teacher was super chill and awesome, but he was no longer able to teach me as he was moving away. I felt like I still wanted to move forward with my learning, so I decided to look up other available guitar teachers nearby. I didn't have a driver's license back then, and my guitar case was too heavy for me to be traveling long distances for a couple of lessons a week. I find this one guitar instructor who lived surprisingly close, four or five streets down. We contacted, and he agreed to teach me. To give you guys a bit of an idea about this guy, he was a tall, slim, white guy. Even though he looked a tad on the scrappy side, you could definitely tell that he was strong. He would also mention how he did lots of outdoor sports. He looked to be around his early 40s, but I'm pretty sure he was actually in his mid-30s. He had these big, pale blue eyes, sunken cheeks, and was balding, had a shaved head. So yes, in retrospect, he did look rather disturbing, but I didn't want to go and judge a guy by looks at first encounter. On the first lesson, I went to his place with my guitar. But after seeing me play, he told me he couldn't teach me because he only taught beginners. Even though I told him that I had played for six years. So for the rest of the time, we just jammed. And chilled. And then I left. The next day, I got a text from him saying that he had an old guitar book he wasn't using and wanted to give to me. Earlier that day, I had a huge fight with my sister, so I was eager to get out of the house for a breather anyway. I met him at a halfway point to receive the book from him. After doing so, I said my goodbyes, but as I was leaving, he started to follow me. I was sort of confused at this point, but he just casually held conversations, so I just chatted with him on my way home. We got to my place. I dropped off the book, we played guitar together for a bit, and hung out. Suddenly, he started talking to me about a waterfall near his place. I was confused because I'd never heard of this place. Why would there be a waterfall nearby? I live in an urban neighborhood. He was super shocked that I hadn't seen it and insisted that we go. It's only ten minutes away, I promise. My stupid, naive ass agreed because he promised it was super close. 
So we headed out to this so-called waterfall. This is where shit went downhill. As we were walking to the waterfall, the conversation started to change. He asked what nationality I am, so I told him that I'm Korean. Suddenly, he hugged me super hard, saying, I love Koreans. I was bewildered at this point, but I awkwardly let it pass. He started talking about himself and how he dropped out of high school early because he had violent tendencies. He said he threw tables at his teachers and threatened kids. I let him talk, but inside started to feel extremely uncomfortable. I was constantly checking around the street, but found there wasn't a single person to be seen. He continued to ask me uncomfortable things, like if I was a virgin, and how he liked to think about classical pieces in his mind while he had sex. I wish I was lying about that, but I'm not. At one point, he picked up a flower and tried to put it in my hair. I declined and pulled away from him. He told me that he liked flowers because he can preserve their beauty even after death. Now at this point, I'm shitting myself. My heart was pounding. I was terrified, but I didn't know how to tell him that I didn't want to go to this waterfall. It's been 20 minutes at this point and no such place has been seen. I constantly asked him where the waterfall was, but he brushed it off saying, we're almost there. Eventually, after about 30 minutes of walking, we got to a random bush track. I'm beyond uncomfortable at this point, and my mind is racing for any excuse not to go in. I suddenly spotted a guy coming out of the bush track, and let me tell you, I couldn't have been more relieved to finally see another human being. I sent the guy a huge, pleading look, and he seemed perplexed. He glanced over at my guitar teacher, but didn't say anything and left. My heart sank. Now let me tell you, the guy actually wasn't lying about the waterfall. It really did exist. But who gives a shit at this point, right? I'm alone in a place I'm not familiar with, with a guy who is saying some really scary things. I let him walk ahead whilst behind my back I began texting my older sisters to call me ASAP. My phone rang, so I answered the call. My sister is on the line like, what the fuck is going on? Are you still with that guy? Where are you? I just faked a wobbly smile and answered, hey, what's up? What? You want me to come home right now? It's an emergency. Okay, okay. Meanwhile, the guitar dude is watching me carefully. I told him I need to leave, and suddenly his facial expression changed. Why? He said in a low, intimidating way. His demeanor did a 180, no longer smiling. Why do you have to do as your sister tells you? His big, pale eyes were unblinking. I kept insisting that it was an emergency but he was not budging one bit. He started demanding that the waterfall is literally right there and we're so close. At this point, the bush track that we had walked was sloped downward. I was wearing a pair of boots at the time, but was constantly slipping as we ventured down. It had dawned on me that even if I were to run, it was most likely that I would either slip or he would catch up to me very easily. Inside, I'm freaking out like crazy because I honestly have no idea how to get back. So eventually, I decide the best thing to do is just agree and get this over with. I weakly agree that we can go and see this godforsaken waterfall only for five minutes max, then I need to leave. He suddenly changed back to all cheery again, and he was leading me again down to the waterfall. By now, I have thoughts that I might actually die here. If he were to harm me in any way, there would be no one to hear my cries. So when he wasn't looking, I started taking pictures of my surroundings. Random part of the bush track, some distinct rocks. 
Because my thoughts were, if I were to get murdered here, then maybe, just maybe, the police might find this phone and trace it to me. There are no words to truly express that feeling of, I am going to be murdered. If anything were to happen, would my family be able to find me? No one would ever suspect to look at a place like this. By this time, the sky was getting dark, and the guitar guy insisted on making a fire near the waterfall. I just agreed. He made a small fire, and we just sat in silence, staring at the flames for a bit. I heard a small sigh beside me, but continued to stare at the fire. After about the third sigh, I glanced over at him. He was staring straight at me with his huge, unblinking eyes, the flames making a disturbing shadow over his smiling face. He stayed like that for a solid 15 seconds. He began to scoot over closer and asked if he could give me a massage. I told him no. He then asked if I was cold and tried to cuddle me. So I stood up and said five minutes was up and I needed to leave. He seemed satisfied that we did spend some time at the waterfall, so he agreed to take me home. The whole time back, he was constantly nudging me and asking me why I was so quiet. I was beyond too traumatized to answer. He forced his arm in mine, and we linked arms all the way home. It suddenly started to rain, and he just paused and forced me to face him. He asked me if he could kiss me. For once, I looked him straight in the eyes and said no. He seemed offended and asked why not. It's just a kiss. It doesn't mean anything. I told him no again, and he let it go. We're almost at my house, finally, before he stopped and said, well, this is yours. For a second, I was confused, but realized he mistook my house for a couple blocks down. I just nodded and said goodbye to him. I walked in the driveway to the front door, waited until he was definitely gone, before I bolted out and all the way home. My sister answered the door, furious and demanding what the hell had happened and why I didn't answer her 50 missed calls. I didn't even have the energy to say anything. I just went upstairs to the bathroom, took a scathingly hot shower, and scrubbed my body clean three times. I know this story is extremely long, but trust me, this wasn't even all the creepy shit this guy said to me. He continued to send me messages and call me, but I ignored him. He began to grow angry and demanded for his book back. I eventually told one of my friends who was mortified at what happened. She said to just ignore all his calls. I did have little comfort in the fact that he thought I lived a couple houses down, but was terrified every time the doorbell rang as I pictured one of my family members answering it to find him at the door with a knife to kill us all. My friend had insisted on going to the cops, but what was the point? I was 18, and technically he didn't do anything illegal. After I blocked his number, that was the last I'd ever hear from him. It took me another five years to recover from the trauma, though never completely. I work on oil rigs. I have ever since I was 20, and I'm 33 now. In 2007, I was working for Nomac Drilling. They have since sold out to Patterson, and we were drilling in the Haynesville for natural gas. Anyone who works on rigs knows that the work can take you way off the beaten path from what normal civilization is used to. Some places, you're on ranch roads for an hour before you reach the location, and others, you're driving on roads canopied by trees in the backwoods of Louisiana. 
This happened to me in the latter. We were rigging down after finishing a well, and we were on our last night of the seven-day hitch. About halfway through our twelve-hour tower, we had pretty much finished and were making sure everything was tied down securely for the rig move. We killed the light plants, and the driller let us knock off early. This area was accessible outside Houghton, Louisiana and the lease was actually on the back of the Barksdale AF base, but we had to leave the way we came in. Driving home at two in the morning seemed pretty normal at first, and I made it to the blacktop with no issues. The blacktop was still canopy by trees, and other than the lights from my truck, everything was pitch black. Out of nowhere, still basically in the middle of nowhere, this thing appears almost close enough to get hit on my driver's side. Okay, weird. But even more strange, he was leaning at what I swear was an impossible angle for someone to not tip over. Its hands were stretched, reaching towards my truck, and what I could see of the face was morbid and twisted. The hairs on the back of my neck raised and I gassed it to speed back closer to society. It was about a two-hour drive home, and I felt off for the rest of the trip. More oddly, I was working over on a separate occasion with one of the crews that work when I'm home, and another hand was talking about a very similar, if not identical, experience. I don't know who or what I saw, and the face could have been a blur from relative distance, speed, and the time I actually saw them. But who is out that late, and why? If someone was broken down, I could see them trying to flag me. But this didn't seem to be the case here. I should start by saying that I am sensitive, but have never known about or tried any of my abilities to sense the paranormal. I recently stayed at the Stanley Hotel in New York. After pulling onto the property, I immediately felt extremely uneasy and had a sense of dread. Just an overall bad feeling about the place. After entering the building, I started feeling nauseous and lightheaded like I was going to pass out, and weird stabbing pains were all around my head not a normal headache. As the night progressed, I started getting flashing images in my head depicting horrible, violent, graphic scenes of myself being stabbed and choked, and figures who were standing over me. I felt as if I weren't alone in my own head. I felt random bursts of anger and sadness and would want to either hurt the people that I was with, or just start hysterically crying. I have never felt so out of control, like my head was in a fog, and everything that was happening was a dream, like I was there in my head, but I couldn't control my body. It has been five days since I left, and I still don't feel like myself. What happened to me in that hotel? Disclaimer, I am completely aware that this story involves me being very stupid and careless. I'm not going to inject these acknowledgements into the story, but rest assured that in hindsight, I am aware of the foolishness that took place. Now, where to begin? The year was approximately 1998 or 1999. I was a young gay man in my early 20s, living in a medium-sized city in the Midwestern U.S. This was sort of an in-between transitional time for gay people, where in most populous areas we had enough respect to live openly, but there was still plenty of people who did not like us. It was well before the invention of smartphones, and the internet was still in the early stages of mass adoption. There were large communities online, but it was not yet at that point where most Americans were online. 
Online socialization consisted of chat rooms hosted by various services like AOL, Yahoo, or IRC servers, and message boards were still in use by large numbers of people. For gay men at the time, it was nothing short of revolutionary. Prior to the internet and to the broader cultural changes, gay men had been stuck looking for fun in secretive and or shady places due to the inability to freely express ourselves. In the 90s, it was still somewhat risky, but the internet offered a way to talk freely and relatively anonymously without the risk of being outed or worse. For this reason, it really took off in the gay communities, and gay men were a very large part of the user bases for these social platforms. It was suddenly very easy and relatively safe to find dates, friends, or just sex, and it quickly became the norm for a lot of gay men. On the other hand, being such a new tool for most people for communication, we were sometimes blind to the risks. Being an attractive young man in my prime, I made liberal use of the online communities to find dates. That is to say, I had plenty of hookups. My city had a decent number of chat rooms and personal message boards, and I had mostly great experiences. I met the typical assortment of good guys, closet cases, and the weirdos that you would expect. I was an absolute quote-unquote hoe by most standards, but suffice to say that a cute gay guy at that time could literally generally have a lot more dates than your typical straight person. At some point during this time, I had some brief chat on a message board with a guy from my city. I forgot his screen name, it's been over 20 years, so let's call him SlimGuy65. This back and forth had happened on a general thread in the gay section, not in private messages, so it was visible to anyone who chose to read that thread. Nothing had come of it, but a week later, I received an email from an unrecognized address. The email basically said, Hey, I'm not gay and I don't agree with the gay lifestyle. I'm here because my friend met this guy SlimGuy65 from the message board and the guy really hurt him. I don't want to see this happen to anyone else. My friend tried to tell the police, but they wouldn't do anything. I see you're talking to Slim Guy 65 so just be careful and stay away from him. Okay, I thought. That's strange. What does this person mean by really hurt him? Was his heart broken? Did he get beaten up or verbally abused or what? I responded to the email, asking for clarification on what exactly had happened. I never received a response. I was slightly weirded out by it, but on the other hand, it's an anonymous email from someone who doesn't respond and is vague about their warning. This could be anything. It could be some disgruntled ex trying to mess with the guy. It could be a real warning about some gay bashing. It could be someone trolling who doesn't have anything to do with anyone. I kept it in the back of my mind, but pretty much shrugged it off. Several weeks later, I had a weekday off of work and decided to take to the internet, as was my custom. Lo and behold, I had an email response to a personal ad. It was SlimGuy65. He was offering to meet at his place to hang out and just have a good time. Wink wink, nudge nudge. I won't go into the details, as I recall there weren't really many details discussed other than small talk and intros that we had done previously. Nothing about this guy was really sounding interesting to me, but I had no other offers on this day, so I decided why not. I'll go see what this dude is about. As I typed my reply, I suddenly remembered the strange email that I had received warning me about this person. I went back and reread it. Still vague, still presenting more questions than answers. Should I take this anonymous warning at face value and just ignore SG65? I decided to go check him out anyway. His address was on a rather busy street in the middle of a dense residential area, not some shack out in the woods, and I can handle myself. If he's weird, I can just nope out of there. Before long, I arrived at the house at the agreed time. It was a duplex-style home, with one apartment on the ground floor and one on the second floor, part of a row of several identical duplexes. It was the middle of the afternoon, there was plenty of traffic on the street, and the occasional person out on their porch or their backyard. I pulled up the driveway to the parking area behind the house, got out, and knocked on the door. 
The guy that answered was a pretty normal, kind of mousy looking man, probably in his 40s. Slight, slim build, soft spoken, looked like just about any guy working in any office cubicle anywhere. Not really my type, but honestly, my curiosity was piqued, and I had nothing better to do, so I stepped inside to take a look around and gauge the situation with the warning email fresh in my mind. I stepped into the back door, into the kitchen. It was very clean, and there was nothing out on the counters, no table, no chairs, nothing. That is to say, it did not look like someone was living there. It had been kept up and cleaned, but was empty. Looking out into the apartment, I could see that it was not set up as a living space. It had a large window with sliding glass that was between the kitchen and living room, and I could see what looked like a large table out in the living room area. SG-65 said something like, this isn't where I live. A friend of mine used to run a doctor's office here and I maintain the building for him. It's private though, we have the place to ourselves. Weird. Okay. He shut the back door and locked it with a keypad deadbolt. The kind you need a key to open, even from the inside. And put his keys in his back pocket saying, so what do you want to do? At this point, my danger sense spiked. This is not a normal home, and why is he locking the door like that? It's not necessarily suspect, a lot of people have that sort of lock on their door, and the door has a window in it, so it makes sense, even. Still, something is not right here, I can tell, and now I'm locked in. I asked him why he was locking the door like that, which immediately flustered him. He was looking around rather nervously, and his voice was wavery and halting. Not quite stuttering, but almost. He said, um, well, we don't want someone to come in and interrupt us, right? Flashing a weak, unconvincing smile. His demeanor and body language were all I needed to confirm that this guy was up to no good. Or at least, that there was something he was hiding. However, I could tell that I was intimidating him. I wasn't a particularly muscular kid, but I have a larger frame. Like, even when I'm at my thinnest, I still wear size L tops and 36 waist pants, so I look big, which people tend to interpret as me being stronger than I really am. Also, I'm not a tough guy at all, but I have a resting facial expression that makes me look like a thug. People who don't know me often assume that I'm rough or something. I sometimes use this to my advantage while I can because before long a new acquaintance will eventually figure out that I'm a total wimp. But this was definitely an occasion to play up the tough guy appearance, and I did exactly that. I put on my best steely face and told him to unlock the door and that I don't want to be locked in here. He looked for a moment like he was going to pee his pants, then said, Okay, alright, I'll unlock this. He unlocked the deadbolt. And I'll just lock the knob here. And he turned the little dial that locks the doorknob. That was fine with me. I continued to stare at him until he said, I'll leave the keys on the counter right here. And he set his keys down near the sink. I was relatively satisfied with that answer. At this point, though, my adrenaline was flowing, and I was almost in full flight-or-fight mode. But I was stuck. Kind of stuck in place. The guy was between me and the door. I was freaked out, but this little weasel did not appear to pose any immediate physical threat to me. I could tell that his pant pockets were empty, and that I was intimidating the living hell out of him. I didn't yet know exactly what to do. Now keep in mind that despite my wordy descriptions, this all happened very quickly without any really long pauses. It had only been maybe one to two minutes since I had stepped in the door. This all happened at the pace of a conversation. The guy was obviously nervous and trying not to appear so. He said, well, let's go in, and walked a wide path around me through the kitchen into what would normally be the living room, and toward the hall to the right from there. I was familiar with this floor layout, it's very common in the area. The hallway would lead to two small bedrooms, with a bathroom in between them. I hesitated, thinking that I should just walk out that back door and take off. But really? Now I was super curious. I knew there's no way in hell I'm doing anything with this guy, but I kinda wanna see what's going on in here. Also, I'm confident that he can't take me if it comes to a fight. 
So, I slowly headed toward the living room. It felt like I was walking in slow motion. From the kitchen entrance, I could see a large, rectangular, stainless steel table taking up a lot of the living space. I remember thinking this looks like a surgical table. It looked like it could rise and tilt, and it had a recessed channel running all the way around the edge. In hindsight, I now know what it was. It was 100% a mortician's table. Dude had a mortician's table in there. But at the time, I just thought it looked like some sort of medical table. There were some other office-type cabinets and stuff around, I think, but now all I really remember is the table itself. The large front window looking out onto the street was covered by vertical blinds that were closed. SG-65 said something like, This used to be a doctor's office, like I said. Come on back here. The hallway revealed the room setup that I had expected. The first bedroom door was closed. The second door was open to a very small, very clean bathroom. At the end of the hall was the other bedroom, which looked like, if the doctor's office story were true, had at one time been converted to an exam room. He said, we can go in that room if you want. Go ahead and take a look. And he stayed by the other closed bedroom door. The back bedroom door was open, and I could see the walls were covered in a honey-colored wood paneling, the type you might see in a den or office that hasn't been updated since the early 70s. I slowly took a few steps toward that door, trying to be very aware of what Mr. Creepy was doing behind me. He didn't move. When I got up to that room, the first thing I noticed was the door had a keypad deadbolt lock, just like the back door. This room locked from the outside. I wondered if there was a lever on the inside, but I pretty much know the answer to that question without needing to check. I also saw a chair. A non-swiveling, plastic desk chair with thin metal legs sitting near the center of the room. The room had old, dark carpet and those wood-paneled walls. I noticed that the walls were completely paneled with no windows. And I know that room had at least one window, probably two, so whoever did that paneling went over them on purpose. There was also a phone in there, plugged in, and sitting on the floor. It was an old office phone, probably from around the 80s or early 90s. Dingy beige plastic with several buttons to manage different phone lines. It was just sitting there on the carpet near the wall, with the chair at a slight distance facing the phone. There was nothing else in that room. I was standing at the threshold of the room, with one foot slightly in, absolutely not going past that door frame. I looked back at Dude. He was still standing by the other door, just nervously smiling at me, trying very hard to look casual, but obviously very nervous or something. He said something like, well, what do you... what do you want to do? Instead of answering, I felt around the back side of the deadbolt lock. Sure enough, nothing there but the smooth wood of the door. It also dawned on me that I did not see a light switch anywhere for the ceiling lamp. Where was the switch? Who knows? It should have just been on the inside of the door, of course, but that original switch was covered by the paneling. He mumbled something about not having the key to that lock. Don't worry about it. I turned back to face the guy and just said, What is it that you want to do in here? My skin had gone ice cold, as I realized that I was way, way, way too far into this apartment. I was running through my options in my head. What was this guy going to do? He didn't appear to have any weapon or anything in reach, but who the hell knows what goes on in that place? What are you trying to do? He was almost totally derailed by that. He stammered out, some hot man-to-man -man fun? With the weakest smile that I have ever seen, looking like he was just a hair's breadth away from panicking. That sounds comical, but really, that sentence was probably the most chilling part of the entire experience for me. It was the way he said it. Like he had to come up with something on the fly, something that would sound plausible, and he failed. Who says that in real life? Hey, do you want to have some hot man-to-man -man fun? Nobody. It's something you'd see on an advertisement for a cheesy porn site or something. That was it. 
I said, nope, I want to go, I'm leaving. He said, uh, okay. I quickly walked past him as he flattened himself against the wall to avoid me and I noped right out through the living room dissection area and through the kitchen to the back door, which was thankfully still not deadbolted. The keys were still on the counter. I let myself out and didn't bother closing that as I saw him slowly coming to the door behind me. I deliberately walked, not ran, to my car. Looking back at the building, I could see that indeed there was a window facing the backyard area from that paneled room, but of course, it was covered up from the inside. Dude was shutting and locking the back door, and I left, heart pounding, skin icy cold, thinking, holy crap, what was that? So, was this guy some sort of killer? Or was he just an awkward, closeted gay guy with access to a sterile-looking apartment with an autopsy-slash-mortuary table and a windowless room that locks from the outside with a chair and a phone and no light switch? It's clear to me that the poor soul who walks into that room gets locked in. He probably shuts off the light from somewhere and calls the phone. Other than that, it's anyone's guess as to what actually happens. I assume the friend of the judgmental person who emailed me must have been some kid that got locked in for whatever game ensues. Driving home, at first I thought, of course I have to call the police and tell them what's in that place. But, thinking it through, I realized that I didn't really have any crime to tell them about. I went to meet a man for casual sex and what? He has a room with a chair in it. He has, as I thought at the time, an exam table. The police aren't going to do anything with that story. The guy didn't touch me or do anything to me, and I left. I considered calling an anonymous tip line, but again, what exactly would I report? There was no actionable crime. Also, keep in mind that at that time, while the local police in this city were pretty decent, they weren't especially interested in getting involved with helping out the gays. They would prosecute actual crimes if it was cut and dry, but I heard plenty of accounts of them not choosing to follow up on cases where there was not an easy arrest to be made. I decided not to report anything because nothing would come of it except drawing unwanted attention to myself. Even in retrospect, I think that that was probably the most rational choice to make. If this happened today in 2020, the law enforcement would probably be a lot more interested in it. But back then, not so much. So, live and learn. I still drove past that house once in a while during the normal course of life over the next several years, and I'd pay attention to how it looked. The vertical blinds were closed for maybe five or six years whenever I went past. Then, eventually, the blinds were down, and there were decorative curtains in the windows, so I assumed that the place was eventually sold to someone who actually lived in it. Around 2002, maybe 2003, there was the murder of a young man on the news. He had been found in the next state, which borders on my city, so it's not very far away. I recognized the guy from the gay community, but didn't know him personally. A friend mentioned to me something about the local serial killer. I said, what? He explained that a few young men had gone missing over the past year, each after being at one specific dive bar and each being found several miles to the north past the state line and out in the country. The case on the news matched with that M.O. My friend told me that the young guy had been at that bar and left with someone that night and that he had disappeared. The news report didn't mention anything about a gay bar or similar recent cases, of course. I had to wonder if my acquaintance from the internet had anything to do with it. The location of the murders apparently was nowhere near that duplex, or at least according to the story I was told. I never heard of a resolution to that murder on the news, or any official mention of a suspected serial killer other than gossip. I, a 23-year-old female, just wanted to share what I would call my first real encounter. Even as a lifelong skeptic, I can't explain this. 
If you're familiar with U.S. ghost hunting spots, you might have heard of the Copper Queen Hotel in Bisbee, Arizona. It has been open since 1902 and has been the subject of multiple paranormal investigations and shows, and there are supposedly three documented ghosts who inhabit it. That of a drowned child, a man in a top hat, and a forlorn prostitute. My boyfriend and I decided on Saturday morning that we would take a trip to make up for a missed birthday. We had never gone on a real trip together, so we didn't plan it well at all. We just realized that we were about an hour and a half from Bisbee and decided to book a hotel once we got there. We chose the Copper Queen because it was the most prominent hotel in the area and is right in the middle of everything. We weren't aware of its reputation as a paranormal hotspot. The room itself was antique looking, as expected with a hotel that old. Yellowing wallpaper, splintering wood floors, dim lighting. The locks on the door were pretty flimsy and you had to actively yank it shut or it would fall open again. We joked that it looked like the Tower of Terror. After a day of walking around, we came back to get changed. We heard a creaking noise, and I had Coop check under the bed, only half seriously, but I was still relieved that nobody was there. We grabbed a lighter and went out for a smoke, then came back, showered, watched TV for a little while, and then turned out the lights. The moment that we shut the lights off, there was a variety of clicks, creaks, and pops in odd patterns. It being an old room, and us being a logical couple, we figured that it was the old fan or the wall-mounted AC. I was just listening to the noises when I felt Coop freeze up next to me. Is that you? I responded no, that it was the AC. Not that. Seriously, is that you? I asked him what he meant and waited for a minute or so before asking again. And again. Finally, he answered. I was trying to listen, babe. I hear someone breathing. We reasoned that it was the room next door and settled back into our pillows, and then I remembered that there wasn't another room on that side. Our room was the first on the landing, and the side that we were closest to, the side that Coop would have been able to hear, if at all, was the main staircase. Coop, being a 21-year-old boy, is blessed with the ability to fall asleep within seconds. I could hear him snoring, and his legs were over mine, but I was too anxious to sleep. I then felt the lightest tap on top of the quilt, just next to my feet. I froze, but tried to reason with myself that Coop had just twitched in his sleep, although his legs were still on top of mine. A few moments passed and I thought that I had imagined it, and then I felt a pinch-slash-tugging motion at the same area of the quilt. I woke up Coop and demanded that he check under the bed again. I was still reasoning that there was a non-supernatural explanation for the events, and it occurred to me that although we had checked before leaving our walk, we hadn't checked after. The flimsy lock and the fact that the door was difficult to close made it seem likely that someone could have snuck in. Coop was too groggy to be useful, so I grabbed my phone, turned the flashlight on, and leapt as far from the bed as I could while crouching to check what was under it. Nothing. We were both a little freaked out by this point and agreed to turn the TV back on to drown out any weird noises. We turned on Futurama and settled back into bed for the third time. Again, Coop fell asleep within seconds. I was drifting off when I heard the audio on the TV kind of cut somehow. It suddenly shifted tone to where it sounded like a grainy VHS instead of a streaming adult cartoon. I heard a woman saying something about a phantom, and then a blood-curdling scream from the TV. At this point, I was too scared to open my eyes, so I studied my breathing and pretended to be asleep. That's the last event that I could recall, and upon checking out the next day, the manager asked if we had experienced anything. That's when we googled the hotel and found out its history of hauntings. So there it is. Nothing too crazy compared to other posts here, but I have definitely never experienced anything like that before and don't have an explanation besides the paranormal. So, I've always had hyper-realistic dreams. 
I also have always believed that my dreams are how God talks to me. I know that sounds a little crazy. Regardless, the other night I had a dream that I believe is a sign. I also should say that my walk in faith has been wavering in the past year, and I've also been going to see psychics a few times a year since last December. Anyway, to the dream. I believe I was on a road trip with a couple of my buddies. We stopped at a little diner in a small town that had a psychic, gimmicky store attached to it. I was waiting for my friends to use the bathroom, and when they both came out, they both said that they wanted to go and do a reading. I said, all right, and that I would wait for them to be done. They went through this black-lit corridor through a purple-curtained doorway. They came back out not too long after, all smiling and cheerful. They told me that I should do a reading, but something didn't feel right. I've always been sensitive to energies in general, but there was something about this place. They kept tugging me when all of a sudden the psychic came out. Immediately, all the alarms were going off in my head. She came up to me and got really close to my face. She had these bulging eyes, and her face was full of super white makeup, really heavy eyeshadow and eyeliner. Her hair was a fire truck red and slicked back into a bun with feathers and things sticking up. She was really freaking me out, but I was like, all right, whatever, so we start. She grabs me by the shoulders, and we make very intense eye contact, and she starts telling me a bunch of things like I have the gift, something that I already know, and we start backing away almost like a dance, and then we both get on all fours and drop down on our bellies, and she starts to slither toward me. Literally, slithering, without using her hands. This is when I know something is actually really up. I stop everything. I stand up, and am telling her that I'm done. She is still slithering toward me. She then slithers all the way up my body until her face meets mine. Then she says, let me show you the way. I say no. This makes her super angry, and she picks me up by my throat and keeps chanting, let me show you the way, let me show you the way. She starts running with me in her hand, and the room keeps elongating, so she keeps running. Then snakes start coming out of her sides, and they burrow into my skin. I feel the pain of them digging into me and biting me. I'm grabbing onto her wrists, and I scream, no, there is only one way, God is the way. And I scream this while making eye contact, and she starts screaming bloody murder. And I get the strength to gouge out her eyes with my thumbs. More snakes and spiders begin pouring from her eye sockets, and I scream that again, that God is the way. And that's when I woke up. Happy Valentine's Day weekend to everyone. Not a lot of romance happening in the Gribble house, but we did have a lot of action. On Sunday evening this past week, a pair of childhood friends named Katie and Lauren investigated with us. The two girls had a mutual friend that had passed away when they were kids, named Lauren. As they investigated, they could hear her name being said through the ghost box several times in a row, and all over the warehouse. The girls told our lead investigator, Kelly, that she had been to see a psychic in the past and had been told that her deceased friend Lauren was definitely with her. Another group investigating on Sunday night were using the Ovalis on dictionary mode, and they had both the Ovalis and the spirit box say, save her, twice in a row. While Kelly was seated in the slave quarters with several guests who were investigating, they heard from a spirit named Anthony and his wife, as well as a child spirit named Will. Tuesday night was great as well. The ghost box and ghost meters were the star of the show that night. A ton of different names came through, like Adam, Helen, Tom, Meredith, and of course, Paul. Paul was his regular charming self, and called one of the investigators as fat ass. One of the women investigating asked, why would you say such a thing? 
to which she got the response of his laughter through the ghost box. Paul was fairly cooperative that night, actively communicating through the ghost box with several groups of guests. However, when they requested that he do things like touch their hands or move the EMF detectors, his response was simply no. We got some amazing EVPs that night through the ghost boxes. One group investigating asked a spirit if they were nice, to which they got the response, what do you want? Another group got a sinister response from their questions. They asked a spirit named Tom, who told them that he was the one who killed Meredith and the lady by the door. The investigation on Friday night went great as well. Orbs were everywhere, as well as EMF and ghost meter action. Don't forget about the Raggedy Ann doll. Several times during the evening, she lit up from head to toe, not just the hands or feet separately. One man investigating told a female spirit that he was communicating with that if anything or anyone decided to follow him home that evening that he would be very ticked off. The only response that he got to that was laughter through the ghost box along with the word clown. Another group was using the spirit box and ended up conversing with a soldier from the Revolutionary War who answered questions about the battle through the ghost meter. The battle was the Siege of Savannah. A few children were heard from Friday night as well. One little box told the investigators that his name was Leo. When they said goodbye to Leo for the night, the right hand of the Raggedy Ann doll lit up. Over near the residual haunting area, they could hear children's giggles through the spirit box. When Kelly was leaving the warehouse for the night, she thought that she could see an older man standing inside the gated area of the Gribble house. Needless to say, she left with chills that evening. Last night, on Valentine's Day, we had two separate investigations. During the first, the Raggedy Ann doll had some very interesting action. While seated in the slave quarters, everyone investigating was focused on the doll, just as the doll moved all on its own. A little child named Wendy was heard from the spirit box in the slave quarters as well, and the REM pod lit up with small touches. As the guests were leaving the warehouse from the first hour, a few of them were looking back into the building and swore that they saw two women entering the area by the bathroom, but no one was there. During the second investigation, a group of two saw a black shadow figure moving along the Gribble House walls, accompanied by a dramatic drop in temperature as well as whispers and strange noises. Yet another great week of investigation at the Gribble House Paranormal Experience. This story is from 2013. I travel a lot for work. I mean, before COVID. And when I do, I stay at hotels. Sleeping in a different bed doesn't bother me as I'm mostly a sound sleeper, and I'm used to it given that I've been doing this for a while. This was a hotel in the suburbs of Chicago. From the time I checked into the room, I think it was room number 413, I have never felt such a sense of dread, despair, and claustrophobia. I am a rational person, no history of depression or mental illness, so I explained it to myself that maybe the 13 in the room number was messing with my head. But I've stayed in other hotel rooms with a 13 in my assigned room number. I had also stayed at the same property every week over the last few months, but I had never felt this way. I pondered while lying in bed if I should call the front desk and ask for another room. I didn't know what excuse that I would give to them. Everything was great with the room, the shower was fine, the room was spotless, the toilet had no issues. It was a boring, predictable, clinically consistent room like any other Marriott property. No complaints on the Wi-Fi. I couldn't bring myself to lie to the front desk and ask to be changed to another room. So I told myself I was a rational man, a husband, a father, and a protector. I decided that I was going to stay put. The uneasiness didn't lessen, so I turned on every light in the room, took out all the Bibles from the bedstands, and set them next to me. 
I am not of the Christian faith and not very religious either, but I felt like I needed all the protection I could get. So I played chants on loop on YouTube from my own religion all night at low volume until I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning, worked out, showered, and went to work. The night's experience felt like a fleeting memory during the day. I had a really fun rental that week, a Mustang GT, and it was so much fun the night's memory almost felt imaginary entirely. I came back from work that evening feeling a little silly about the night before and went back to the room. In an instant, the same sense of unexplained dread and claustrophobia came flooding back. I just couldn't rationally explain it. So I went back to the routine from the night before. Lights on, chanting, Bible, Marriott, Mormon Bible, all by the bed. Next evening, I spoke with the bartender and asked him if he had heard any weird complaints. He said he hadn't, but he'd ask around. When I came back the next week, I got a different room, but I checked in with the bartender. He said he had done a little digging over the weekend and picked up on gossip from the other hotel staff that some of the cleaning ladies didn't like that room and even that corner of the fourth floor. He was intrigued enough that he brought along a sensitive friend of his from his Episcopalian church and said that when she opened the door and had barely taken a step inside that she just made a 180 degree turn and came right back out. She couldn't even go inside and said that it felt heavy. The bartender said that it was enough to spook him. He said he just stood in the corridor and refused to go in after that. We kind of had a laugh about it and figured that we would Google the property address to see if there were documented murders or suicides, but there was nothing. The property changed hands a few times. There was a nearby fire with some deaths, but nothing notable as far as Google search goes. I didn't think much of it, but I have stayed more than 2,000 nights in hotels since the fall of 2013, and I have yet to experience that fear, ever. I continue to rethink about the memory of my experience, trying to recount the details about the room, the week, maybe the mood at work, just so I could find something rational to explain what I had felt, and I have been unable to. My friends and I used to camp a lot in the El Dorado National Forest. We had a spot along Sopiago Springs we used to camp at a lot. One weekend, we decided to go for a three-day foraging trip. We brought in MREs in case we couldn't find anything, some guns, and some supplies to set up shelter, but that's about it. The first night was chill. We cooked a bunch of crawdads and a squirrel my buddy shot drank a few beers we'd brought, and slept fine. Next day, something felt weird to me. One of my friends who was with me and I had had some really creepy experiences in this part of the forest in the past, and it felt a bit like those. Forest was dead silent, and you felt like something was watching you. I grew up in the woods, so I know the signs of a predator, but this felt different than a bear or a mountain lion. When night fell, my friends went 200 yards or so up the stream to do some stuff, and I was alone at the campsite. The feeling got even stronger, so I built up the fire nice and big and grabbed a gun. I kept hearing faint voices from the woods in the opposite direction from where my friends had went. They were low and distinct sounds, but they were creeping me out majorly, and my buddies had taken the only two flashlights, poor planning in hindsight. As I peered out into the darkness, I caught a glimpse of something moving fifty yards or so out into the trees. I snapped the rifle to my shoulder and got the scope on it. It was pretty dark and the only light was from the fire, but I could see the outline of what I was aiming at. It looked human, but was on all fours, and its arms seemed a lot longer than they should have been. It stood a bit like an ape, but very low to the ground. I only saw it for a second before it loped off deeper into the woods. After I lost track of it, I'd hear light rustling in different directions around the camp, 
leaves scuffling, the occasional twig breaking. Always away from where my friends went, 180 degrees on the other side of the camp from their departure. I got the sense that whatever it was, it was stalking me. I kept the fire high and was staying sharp, looking out into the woods. But I didn't see it again. My buddies came back about ten minutes later to find me a paranoid wreck glancing at the tree line with the scope. I told them what happened and they got quiet. Then told me the reason they came back when they did was they started hearing the same shit that I was hearing by where they were and it had spooked them. We spent the second night of our trip with a big ass fire and three lookouts. Nobody slept that night. In the morning, we broke camp as quick as we could and hightailed it out of there. We never camped in that spot again. My grandparents died about ten years ago. They both died peacefully of old age and left an old house in a countryside. That house has a lot of great memories. My best Christmas and birthdays. Despite that, recently I've started having nightmares that would always have the house in them. Sometimes someone's chasing me, other times there are ghosts. It's always basically a horror movie scenario. Being religious, I thought it was about time to visit my grandparents' graves and light a candle. It's about a three-hour drive, so I decided to visit them and crash at their house for the night. Well, I'm never doing that again. It was still bright outside when I arrived. I went inside to open the windows and clean up a bit. That's when I heard a weird sound. It was as if someone was walking in the room, but no one was there except me. I was spooked, but I convinced myself that there must be rats or other creatures in the attic. I managed to stay calm and rational, and spent the rest of the evening watching YouTube in bed. That's when the fun started. The internet connection is terrible there. You kinda have to walk around the room to catch 4G like some sort of Wi-Fi. Like many times before, my internet lagged and I ended up sitting in silence. This is when I heard it, loud and clear. There was someone in the kitchen, and they turned on the light switch. I was sure it was that switch, because whenever you turn on the light in the kitchen, it made this loud click sound. I literally froze. I was in the middle of nowhere, and I was about to be killed by some maniac. All the knives were in the kitchen too, and I only had pepper spray in my bag. Then the intruder started walking, slow steps as if they were just wandering around. I thought I will die from fear, and I didn't know for how long that I was frozen, but it really did feel like forever. I was literally waiting to be killed. I don't know how much more time passed, but it was long enough that my muscles started spasming from being so intense and not moving. I gathered all courage, hoping that the intruder had left, and somehow managed to go to the kitchen. The light was on as expected, but the person had already left. I ran to the door, expecting to see it wide open, but to my surprise, it was shut down and locked, as I had left it. There was no sign of entry. I'm never going back alone. About two years ago, I was going shopping for a Valentine's Day gift for my girlfriend. It's about a five to ten minute walk to the store from where I live. It was around 8 p.m. and I just wanted to get home. I was walking in the road because there's next to no cars going down the road and I didn't feel like going through the park. I was approaching the park when I realized that I was being followed. I thought nothing of it at first, so I just kept walking. He then got closer and closer, and when I was walking past, I hear a, Hey, kid. I was shocked, but I wanted to ignore him, so I kept going. Then he said it again, a bit more violently. So I turned around, 
and this guy was within reach of me. I'm six foot one, and this man was a bit taller. He then tried to set up a conversation like, how's your night? I felt a bit relieved, and kind of thought poorly of myself for judging him too soon. But I was right in my assumptions. He then tried to keep a conversation going and proceeded to ask me where I was headed. I just told him that I was going to the store. He then walked up to a car and said, I can give you a ride. I said, no thanks, I can walk from here. He kept asking that same question, and then he said, what about car surfing? And then he tried to show me what it was. I still declined. This guy was really creeping me out. I was still walking down the road while this was happening. He followed me still, and thankfully I was reaching the store so he left me alone. But not for long. I got the candy heart chocolate box and a teddy bear, and was walking back home when I saw the guy again. The weird part is that he was following me from the other side. I feel like he waited for me just to come walking by again. This was starting to scare me. He then yelled at me again, and I was terrified. I was hesitant, but I turned around. Now he was starting to jog his way over to me. Then I noticed something off. The car was gone, meaning that this guy had either walked here or he wasn't alone. I acted oblivious like I didn't notice that the car was gone. He tried starting another conversation. I was really uncomfortable, so I just said, I really need to get back, and I started walking faster toward the fastest route home, which is through an alley. When I was going through, he was gone, and I was thankful. But when I was walking down the alley, I don't know what it was, but I saw the same car that he was claiming as his own. When I got home, I wanted to know more about this guy. I looked online for something about him and there was nothing, of course. I wanted to know about the car. I didn't believe for a second that it was his, so I looked it up and it was reported as stolen. I reported it just in case. I'm not sure if they ever found it, or ever found the guy in general. I just hope that I never have to deal with him again. Myself, my younger cousin, and a couple of friends stayed recently at one of the most haunted places in Texas and America. As a kid, I had heard stories of this old hotel and the dark history behind it. In recent years, a few paranormal shows showcased and did some investigations there. When I saw in our local news that the Magnolia Hotel was opening back up for visitors to stay the night, I was stoked. When you stay the night, you get two rooms, regardless of whether you're staying by yourself or you're bringing company. Also, you get the whole second story to yourself for you to investigate. There is a door that separates the hotel, updated, side, and the haunted rooms side. To be fair, the rooms that you stay in are haunted as well. The entire hotel is haunted. Needless to say, I recorded so much activity on tape and in person in my own experiences. The findings I have will raise the hairs on your body. I was hearing voices, seeing shadows, hearing footsteps, showing the EVP sessions and hearing our names. I actually got touched twice and the second time was so chilling. We were outside of this room that had a ton of activity. My friend had the dousing rods. She asked if there was a spirit, and three times it pointed directly at me. She asked if the spirit was next to me. The rod said no. She asked if it was behind me, and they said yes. At that moment, I felt someone grab my right shoulder and slowly move their hand down my back. I got cold chills and felt tingling and numbing for a good few minutes. I am planning to go back very soon. I am a sensitive. I attract ghosts, and I go ghost hunting quite a bit. I have other experiences from several places that are extremely haunted here in Texas and in other states as well.
When I was in high school, I lived in a really small town in Texas. It was the kind of place where everyone was either related or hated each other. I had no family tree there, so yeah. But I did have a pretty blonde girlfriend and was pretty hated for that too. Nothing major, just petty harassment and occasional fights, but it had been escalating. So that's why on Valentine's Day, my girlfriend and I decided to skip the school dance and just stay in and watch a movie at her house while her parents went out. Just better to avoid trouble. We borrowed her dad's car, a little Honda hatchback, and went into town. We stopped at the video store for a movie and went to the Dairy Queen for some ice cream and then headed home. Now she lives in the complete boonies, out in the middle of the woods along a long, lonely road with no street lights. We're chatting, eating our blizzards, when all of a sudden a car comes up behind us. No big deal. What was a very big deal was that when the headlights flooded the interior of our car, I saw two hands on the back seat and a head coming from the hatchback part of the vehicle. As soon as the lights hit, the head and hands retreated back down. A solid chill ran through the entire length of my body. I slowly reached down and pulled out my pocket knife, which was the only thing I had. She saw me and asked what was wrong. Loudly, I said, nothing, I just have to stop at my friend's house real quick. She knew that that was crap. I didn't have any friends. I pulled over at the next house that came up and jumped out of the car, yelling at her to jump out too. She popped out in total confusion. I flipped the driver's seat forward and lunged into the back seat in full maniac mode. This guy popped up like a jack-in-the-box, with empty hands waving around, saying, Hey, hey, what are y'all up to tonight? It was some strange kid from our high school who we had never in our entire lives spoken to before. Ever. I said, what in the holy hell are you doing in our car? His reply was, I thought you guys were going to the dance and I was just hitching a ride. We sat there staring at him with our mouths open, wondering what to do. He tried to act real cool, and obviously we were in the middle of nowhere in some random person's driveway, so whatever he was planning was totally forgotten. We actually ended up driving him to the dance and dropping him off. The whole time he's telling us to come inside with him. Yeah, no. We dropped his ass off and noped out of there as soon as we could. After he got out of the car, my girlfriend started crying and shaking she was so freaked out. I have no idea what he was trying to do when the lights caught him crawling out of that hatchback. I hated that high school. I posted this in a UFO subreddit, as I was not sure what a crawler was until after doing a bit of research. There's a possibility that what I saw that night may have been a crawler as much as it could have been an alien. I never saw a UFO, but I saw an entity mostly associated with UFOs. I grew up in the USSR, in now northern Belarus, until I was 13 years old. 37 years ago, my mother and I saw an entity outside looking in at us through the window. It was hairless, pale white, huge, bulging black eyes. And it had teeth that were very small, very well spaced, skinny, and pointed, almost like an anglerfish. We hid for hours until we heard my father return home. We both looked out to see the being stand up from behind a wall. It was much taller than a human. It was hiding back there behind that wall, and I believe that it was waiting for us to come outside. My father drove up the driveway, and we saw the silhouette of its body from the back. It was hunched over staring at the car. My father saw it in the headlights and what it looked like, perfectly. He drove at it, 
and it ran away into the brush around the house. It never made a sound. It seemed smart but cautious, and the overwhelming feeling that I got that night was that it was vicious and violent. My parents spoke with the police, as we were so horrified about the encounter. After speaking to the police or the KGB, we were relocated and forced to never speak of the event to anyone. Within 30 hours, I was living in a new home nearly 100 kilometers away. I have searched for so many years for an explanation. I've spoken to government officials in Belarus. I have had interviews with people who lived near our home then about 10 years ago. I have no answers. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail that I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in my truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot, and head off the trail to find a place to set up my tent. I stumble upon this nice size clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I'm exhausted at this point, but set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line and manage to get a fire going. I roast some weenies and start to hear a sound in the distance underneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, most likely a deer with a lame leg, as it sounded like the animal was making a walking, kind of dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it and put it out of its misery. I think nothing of it after that, and go about eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and insert myself into my sleeping bag. I decide that even in my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep, so I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear the sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk slash drag across the clearing toward my tent. It was really loud at this point, and now it sounds as if the hooves are being really heavily planted with the dragging noise following seconds after, like the deer is dragging something along behind it. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops, and I hear nothing. No breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and look into the clearing. Nothing but trees and darkness. What on earth? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and sit there listening for other noises. There was just crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods, and I tried to not let it bother me. Besides, I did have my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right, followed by women's laughter and sticks snapping off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing or just a product of being half asleep. Then I hear more faint laughing from a couple other different directions, all sounding like different people, and confirm that this is real. The noises are closing in, and I grab my rifle, preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they come too close. Something about this laughter, how far in the woods that I was, the noise earlier, and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed that the nightlife was dead, quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line, seeing nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings. 
there was no more laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. I relaxed just a bit, and figuring that I had scared whoever off, I sat down, and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering, not very far from my tent. Alert, I grab my rifle again and listen to what they were saying. I can't make out much, but I hear something about being lost, so I shout, Hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I call out again, Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people that were just standing around. In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise, back to my truck with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anyone follow me. I never saw anyone or anything the entire time but couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me. I left all my gear in the woods that night. This is a completely true story. There was one time about two or three years ago. I was out in the woods camping with my brother, and we had just gotten there around 4 p.m. to set up and all. Once we had settled in, we got a fire going. I told my brother I was going to go get some firewood, because we only had enough to get it started. So I went out, and it was around 7 p.m. Then I got really cold all of a sudden, even though the weather was not cold at all. When I got the sudden rush of coldness, I felt a heavy feeling of just pure evil, hatred, and despair. I immediately went back to my brother. He told me it was fine, that it was probably just a strong wind that had given me a chill. But I knew that something was wrong. We sat around the fire, and I just felt like someone or something was watching me. Once again, I started to feel the same feeling of evil, but this time faintly. It slowly started getting worse and worse, almost as if it were growing inside of me. I brushed it off and went back to bed. At around 2.20ish in the morning, I heard something that sounded like a scream, and it woke me up. I looked around in the tent and got a flashlight. When I turned the light on, I noticed that my arm was bleeding and had been cut open by something in multiple spots. I woke my brother in a panic and told him what had happened. He said he didn't know what I was talking about, and my arm wasn't even cut, even though I was looking right at it and it was obviously slashed open and bleeding. I said, are you joking? And he continued to say that nothing had happened to me and that I was just pranking him. At that moment, I felt a huge amount of pain in my arm, and then I heard the scream again. But it didn't sound like how a human would scream. It was more of a screech, as if there were an animal or some creature in the distance that was in pain. I looked at my brother and asked if he had heard it, and he asked me, what do you mean did I hear that? There was nothing. At that point, I was afraid for my life. I was praying that nothing else would happen. But after a few minutes, I heard the scream again. Every time I heard it, I would feel that dread, that evil, again, and my arm would start to have a burning sensation. Eventually, all of it stopped. Although after that, I wasn't able to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I told my brother that I wanted to leave ASAP. When we went to get into the truck, I could have sworn out of the corner of my eye that I saw something run through the woods. I looked to the right while packing the stuff up, and four of the trees had marks like they had been clawed by something. But the thing is that the marks were at least 12 feet up in the trees, maybe higher. I was so tired and scared that I couldn't even think about it anymore. 
I just got into the truck and we left. To this day, I still haven't gone camping again. My boyfriend and I were big fans of nautical history, so we decided to spend our Valentine's Day in 2007 on the Queen Mary. As I'm sure most of you are aware, it's reported to be haunted. That was also the kind of thing that appealed to us, but mostly we have BAs in European history, so it was just cool in general. Anyhow, we got a historical suite, meaning that it was mostly like it had been when the ship was commissioned aside from an old TV. The first night, Valentine's Day night, when we stayed there, we both woke up to what sounded like the drawers of the built-in dresser being opened and slammed shut repeatedly. We're both not the types to freak out and run, but I can't really say why we were both so low-key that we just acknowledged that the other was okay and eventually went back to sleep. Mainly because it was truly alarming at the time. Maybe we just trusted that if we were both okay that everything else was okay? I really don't know. But then, we didn't know the history about the room. The next day, we went on the ghost tour. Turns out that we were sleeping in the second most haunted room on the ship. The room next door was Churchill's suite, where he planned battles during World War II. While we didn't experience the cigar smell that many have reported while staying in that room, it was still interesting that without knowing our room was known to have paranormal events happen, we did have an experience. We had some really weird camera malfunctions in the engine room, as well as creepy, aggressive feelings in an old museum room on the ship, which we only found because we tried to get into every unlocked room that there was. It honestly felt like someone was creeping up behind our backs. But again, just feelings, so... Shrug? Anyway, that's my Valentine's Day ghost story. About 11 years ago, a group of friends and myself drove to Mineral Wells, Texas for a spontaneous midnight exploration of the long-abandoned and supposedly haunted Baker's Hotel. It was incredibly creepy inside. The place was pitch black and littered with old pieces of dusty, moldy furniture and decor from the 50s and 60s, whenever it was last operating. The first thing that freaked us out was that it sounded like the building was breathing and loudly. Turned out it was just flooding in the basement that was echoing through the elevator shafts. Anyways, we started exploring everywhere. By the time we got to the seventh floor, we were a little disappointed that nothing weird had happened yet. The adrenaline was kind of wearing off. We started walking down this long hallway on the seventh floor, peeking into various rooms and peering around with our flashlights. All of a sudden, we heard a door, coming from the end of the hallway we were moving toward, slowly open, and then slowly close. It was creaking very loudly, just like in a scary movie. It scared us, and we froze. We were close enough that our flashlights reached the door in question. It was some kind of small, weird door, framed inside of a larger, regular door. My friend wanted to turn around and leave. We thought maybe there was a homeless person in there, and they were trying to scare us off. Nonetheless, I convinced him to keep going because I had to go in the room now. We started walking slowly toward the door, all the while saying stuff out loud like, we're just exploring, if someone's in there, we're just messing around, things like that. We were probably about 15-ish feet away when the door suddenly began opening again, eerily and slowly like before. However, this time, it slammed shut, right in front of our eyes. Again, we were scared frozen. Again, I insisted that we keep going. A minute or so later, we worked up the courage and just barged right in that door as fast as we could. What was in there? Absolutely nothing. There was no possible explanation for whatever had opened and closed and then slammed that door. 
There were no cracked windows allowing for the airflow from outside. There was nothing. We shut the door behind us and sat down in nervous disbelief, and then chain smoked a couple of cigarettes each. We finally left and actually went through the rest of the building. I used to live on a large property with a lake, 29 acres of land and heavily forested. I was playing. I was about 11 or 12 at the time, outside by myself right after the sun had set. I believe this was in the fall, so there were barely any lights to see outside, maybe except for a light on the house about 50 feet away from the swing set that I was on. Behind the swing set were really tall trees. Not many new or sapling trees were anywhere near. I know specifically that there were no trees short enough to have some owl or animal sit in them, because all the trees, pine trees, were mature and taller than my two-story house. My mom came out to tell me that dinner was almost ready. When she did this, she turned on the outside light on the back porch, illuminating the area so I could see. I was still on the swing set at the time. I start to get up, and I turn around, I think to find my flip-flops, when I see two bright eyes reflecting the light of the outside light, looking at me from about 20 feet away. The eyes were well above any average human size, about seven, seven and a half feet off of the ground, and they were large. I stopped, stunned and really scared. I was familiar with the woods right behind the swing set, and I knew something unnatural was looking at me. I couldn't see the body, but the eyes looked at me and I tried to get an understanding and I thought of something massive and humanoid. Bigfoot. Remind you that no animal could have levitated on that spot longer than five seconds. Even then, there were no perches or anything there to suspect critters. So to end my experience, I ran inside, locked all the doors, and couldn't think straight for the next couple of days. Let's just say I never played outside on that swing set after sunset ever again. I still think about this, and it chills me. This happened to me when I was a teenager. I think it was in the spring of 1998 when I was 14. My Boy Scout troop went camping in the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas. I grew up in a very small town in Tennessee, and the boys in my troop were people that I'd known my whole life, and we were all very close and knew each other very well and trusted one another. We had been hiking for five days or so, and it was miserable. It rained every day, and we were all exhausted and sore and hungry and covered with blisters. The adults realized that we had bitten off more than we could chew in trying to hike a 60-mile trail, especially with the awful weather, so we had changed course and gotten off the trail to spend the night in a drive-in campground. It was the kind of place with hookups for RVs, picnic tables, it had fire pits and grills, and a central bathhouse with showers and toilets. It was in a very remote area, far from a town or another house. There may have been a few other small groups, but if there were, we never interacted with or saw any of them. We were all filthy and wet, and thus very excited about taking a hot shower. It was dark, and we had finished dinner. A group of five of my friends, including my friend Jeremy, who, like everyone else in our group I had known since we were babies, headed up to the bathhouse, which was maybe a quarter-mile walk through the pitch-dark woods up a worn-down gravel walking trail. I stayed behind to clean up, and after 10 or 15 minutes, followed them by myself. I had a weak little flashlight, the old incandescent kind, pre-LED. 
When I got about halfway to the bathhouse, I could see the light from it off in the distance through the woods. I heard a noise to my left, and I looked over and saw my friend Jeremy standing by an old-school manual water pump about 20 feet away off the trail. There was a strange light around him, like the moon had come out from behind the clouds. I was startled to see him there by himself in the woods. I asked him if he was already done with his shower. He seemed kind of sad, and he said, Yeah, it's all yours. I said okay and didn't think much of it until I got to the bathhouse. When I walked in the door, my friends were all in there and I heard Jeremy talking from in the shower. All the blood drained out of my head and all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I had to sit down before I passed out. My friends were really freaked and wanted to know what was wrong. I told them what had happened. They nervously made jokes about how I must have been smoking pot but this was long before any of us had ever experimented with any mind-altering substance. Regardless, I could tell that they believed me. Like I said, we had known each other forever and knew when one of us was exaggerating or playing a joke. We all waited together until everyone was finished showering and brushing teeth and then walked back together in complete silence. When we got to the spot that I had seen, whoever he was was gone without a trace. The water pump was still there, though. No one had noticed it before, because it was a ways off the trail and obviously not in use. We got back to our campsite and went to bed really scared. I remember not sleeping much that night. In all the years since then, I've never been able to figure out what occurred. Was there a random teenage boy in the woods who looked just like my friend? Unlikely. Did I hallucinate it? Also unlikely. So who's to say? I don't think this was paranormal, but it felt so real that it undid many of the knots in my heart. My father passed away 21 years ago, when I was 20 years old leaving behind his mother, my grandmother, wife, my mom, and a daughter, me. Two years before his death, my father had urged my grandmother to sell her small home and shift with us so that we could look after her in her old age. He built a decent house, considering he came from a very poor background, that we had to sell off after he passed away. My grandmother passed away two years ago. I often used to think about how our life would have been had he been still alive. He was an honest man, but in a powerful position. When he passed away, I was still in college and unmarried, with no exposure to the outside world. Had he been alive for a few more years, I could have used his guidance to fulfill my career plans. He was the only earning member of the family. After he passed away, nothing remained the same. We all struggled financially, emotionally, and ultimately physically. Then, I got married to a verbally, financially abusive man. But I saw this dream only yesterday. Never before it. I had not been thinking about him or of any of my difficulties before I went to bed. In the dream, I was in my grandmother's house, which again we had sold 23 years ago. She had passed away, but my father was alive. He was sadly looking at the empty house from his childhood. I asked him what he planned to do with the house. He said he would probably sell it, but he sounded very sad as he said it. Then I suggested if we should keep the house and just rent it out. This way we could return to it whenever we want and have a financial backup too. My father said that in the face of financial difficulty, we have a bigger home to fall back on but he seemed relieved that he didn't have to sell his childhood home. When I woke up, I realized that it had all felt so real, as if I had lived an alternate life. It was what life could have been. I cried, but I also felt that I had been lucky to be able to live in that life. Does anyone believe in alternate lives here? Do you think my soul had made a trip to an alternative life somehow?
When I was 14, I went camping in the summer with the girl guides. We only traveled a few miles away to a place that we had visited a few times for game nights. Each year, our guides would merge with the two others in the area for a huge campout that lasted about five days. The place we were staying in was rumored to have a ghost in the main house. The story says that it only shows itself to members of the family. We were staying on the large estate near the woods, right away from the house. I had been there quite a lot, and knew the grounds pretty well, which was awesome. I was staying in a tent with the younger girls. They were aged 10 to 13, because I didn't have my own tent like the other older girls. The first night went by smoothly. We built a climbing frame, lit candles in the dark, and pretended that we had landed on an alien planet. It was a silly fun game. The next morning, me and one of the other girls get up early. Our group job was to collect firewood for breakfast, so we ventured into the woods on our own. We were joking around, grabbing sticks and stuff as we walked along. We ended up at the obstacle course and decided to play on it for a while, even though it was out of bounds. When we were done, we grabbed the firewood and started walking back to camp. The woods, to me, they felt and looked strange. It was as if the place was slightly different. I decided to start trying to scare the girl that I was with, just messing around, trying to spook her because it was funny to me. She got really scared and ran off and left me behind. I wasn't bothered as I slowly walked back. That was when I saw movement to my left, and then again up ahead. As I was about to leave the woods, I saw a man out of the corner of my eye. He was wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, carrying something long. I think it was a shotgun. There was no one there. I just shrug it off. Stuff like that doesn't bother me. I've seen strangers out in the woods before. Once out of the forest, everything goes back to normal. I looked back and the woods were as they should have been, not like they were moments ago. I don't know how to explain it, they just seemed newer for a while. Not as wild, I guess, but everything was kind of grainy, misty, except that there was no mist. So I don't think anything of it. I enjoy the camp out, we play games, sing songs, and just have a good time. On the second to last day, we play the game. We landed on the alien planet, and once we had breakfast, we had to go hide in the woods, build a shelter, a fire to make food, and people had to go steal food from the campsite without being seen. I am left in the woods on my own for ages as the other girls go around gathering the food. I built a pretty awesome shelter, but I realized I needed my pen knife, which I had left in my tent, so I went to go get it. I get to the tent to find the kids that I was sharing it with, crying their eyes out, terrified. Eventually, I get the story out of them. They had been making their food when a man, wearing a white t-shirt and a cap, had appeared and then vanished in front of them where I had seen him. I assured the kids that it was fine, and that it couldn't hurt them, and they eventually went back into the woods, but they were obviously very shaken. I got the blame for telling them a scary story, but I had only tried to scare that one girl at the very start and hadn't mentioned anything about the man to anyone. That night was the campfire. As it ended, we all ran through the pitch black woods back to camp, leaving the person looking after us all alone in the forest. She had a light, so it was no big deal. She had to make sure that the fire was out as well. I found out a week after that that she had been horrified walking back to camp and refused to go back into the woods again after that. She has refused to camp at that site ever since, but she won't tell us what she saw. The last day, I got bored while packing everything up. After all that had happened, I was in a ghost hunting mood, so me and two of the other girls go into the trees. I'm in the lead, and I'm walking along a path. I stopped and heard footsteps in front of us. Clear footsteps, walking on dead leaves, but no one was there. No one was anywhere near us. I followed the sounds along a path. Someone had heavy boots on. It was so bizarre. We all had trainers on. The girls I was with were silent. They could hear it as well. I followed the sounds around to a clearing at the very edge of the woods, where it stopped. 
I decided to sit down in the grass. The others followed me, but they sat behind me because they were scared at this point. I do the whole, if anyone is there, could you give me a sign? Routine. As I finished, a white mist suddenly fell over the woods. You could see things moving behind it, though nothing was clear. It hung in the air as the other two girls ran off, screaming. I sat for a minute and watched before saying thank you. As I said this, it was as if a gust of wind hit, and it disappeared. There was no wind. It was just amazing. That was the last of the strange stuff for that camping trip. We had to finish packing up and left the camp that afternoon. I've been back a few times since, and nothing else strange has happened. The woods have always felt normal. A few years after that, I found out that I'm actually related to the family who owned the house and estate. I'm always curious if the activity picked up because I was staying on the grounds. This happened February 14th, Valentine's Day. Me and two of my friends decided that we would get a cheap hotel room and take some LSD to kick off the loneliest holiday ever. I've done it before, but was not in a good mindset to take it that night, so I settled for a bottle of wine. Anyway, we weren't familiar with the area of the hotel, but it was cheap and that's all that mattered to us. It was around 3 in the morning, and outside the door we hear someone stumbling around bumping into the walls. But it was Valentine's Day anyway, so we just brushed it off as a drunk couple on their way to get it on. The stumbling stopped and went silent right outside of our door. My friends are tripping at this point, and I'm pretty drunk. We hear this woman start sobbing outside, and I'm assuming that she sat down with her back on our door because we heard her slide down the wall and collapse right on the other side. The woman starts trying to speak to us through the cracks of the door, saying that she lost her dogs and was wondering if we could help her. It was 3 a.m., and we didn't know anything about the area, like I said, so common sense would dictate don't respond. And we didn't. The woman then proceeds to bang on the door, saying that we stole her dogs and that she's going to come in and quote-unquote effing murder us. She was scratching and banging on the door for 10 minutes straight, and then just stopped. My friends were starting to have a bad trip because of her, but when she stopped, I tried to reassure them that she was gone and that they could go back to having a good time. To prove it to my friends, I checked through the peephole to verify that this woman was indeed gone. But there she was, trying to stare right back at me through the other side of the peephole. I watched her as she stepped back and stood there, as still and solid as a literal concrete statue. She had her eyes right on mine. I doubt that she could see me through the peephole, but I was making dead eye contact with her. The woman then proceeds to start screaming and throwing her body against the door, which thankfully woke up our neighbors and they called the front desk. The woman behind the front desk comes and tries to get this woman to leave. The woman left, but was going down the walkways of the hotel being loud and refusing to actually leave the property. She was still crying out for her lost dogs in the hotel hallway at 3 a.m. They said that they never saw her leave and implied that she was still inside, so they just told me to keep an eye out for her and call the front desk if anything else happened. The police were called and stayed posted outside the hotel for an extra 30 minutes and then left. It turns out that she was on some really heavy drugs. But still, hearing this woman throw her body onto the door, saying that she would kill us, was incredibly traumatizing. We left early that morning and never went back. On Labor Day of 2015, my mother, my wife, three children, and I went to a very remote cabin that we had rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort, so it had the cabin and three other sheds and shops. 
I'll try to keep it short now, but this is a really bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin, and decided to take a walk a couple of hundred yards down to the river. We were all barefoot wearing sandals with shorts. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing, throwing rocks, etc. when I realized that there were one-foot snakes everywhere. My wife, mom, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance, I went back with a water bottle and caught one of them to see what it was. It turns out, we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of those things had latched onto one of my kids, then surely they would have died. We were about three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mom and I went for a hike alone while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning about 15 minutes later, all three of my wife and kids were inside with the doors and windows all closed, even though we had opened everything up to cool the place off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was about 150 yards from the cabin huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch while they were eating. It was down by the river, another 30 yards or so down the hill. A few hours go by, and in that time, an ATV passed three times with two inbred-looking freaks on it, and each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us or the cabin. Keep in mind, again, we're hours into the wilderness in Idaho with no sight of a person the entire trip except for them. We decide it's bedtime for the kiddos as it's pitch black out. Within 10 minutes, our son, who was five at the time, went from being perfectly fine, active, and talkative to having a fever of 103 degrees, slightly foaming at the mouth, and being completely unresponsive. That was it. We were leaving immediately and going to seek medical attention. I opened the front door of the cabin to start loading the two cars, and that's when we heard three adults and what sounded like four or six large, heavy animals running all around the cabin and property. There was one on the right side of the house when exiting that I could hear pacing back and forth, breathing heavily. I made everyone stay inside and close the door every time I went out to transfer stuff into the vehicles, which took me about four to five trips. I had a stick in a big pot that I was smacking as hard and loud as I could each time and was yelling loudly at random. As soon as I finished the loading, I took out each kid individually and loaded them into the cars. Then I escorted out my mom and then my wife. My wife and I were in the lead car, so we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or other, I felt that I needed to close it. I got out of my vehicle and walked behind it and my mom's car by about 15 feet and closed the gate. Now this gate is literally a log that slides from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and the animals that sounded like they were out there. Right as I went to turn around, I heard loud padded footsteps walking up to me. Directly in front of me, no more than ten feet, I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I have ever heard in my life rumbles through the air. I turned and ran so fast I swear that I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat of my car some 30 feet in front of me. As I landed in my seat, I slammed it into drive and spun out, finally leaving. It gets weirder and scarier, though. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son. We both kept having this horrible, evil doom kind of feeling, like a shadow over us. I looked down and realized that I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder, so I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. Not even two minutes later, we softly hear our son begin to cry. We realize that he's become responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, Why are we leaving? What's going on? He was crying because he was sad to leave. He couldn't even remember the last hour. The next day, my mom broke down extremely badly, sobbing her eyes out, and was hardly able to even speak. She confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on the camping trip. We came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. 
She said that she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost, and that it was full of evil. Most of all, she said that one of our kids died. I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who died and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to tell me, or anyone else, anything more. She lives her life now with a guilt that she willingly ignored her premonition and put us in that situation nearly taking the life of one of her dearest grandkids away. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know this all sounds insane, but a week later on the local news were reports of a wolf pack in that area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but they do share territories and tend to respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was one and a half hours into the wilderness from Loman Banks, Idaho, if you want to verify that these animals actually exist around there. I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre-early teen years, as did my wife until she was ten years old. I even have a half a sleeve of the wilderness and trees on my left arm. With that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I have a story from about two years ago that really captivates me to this day. When I've told this story to close friends, they tell me it's straight out of a movie. I can't really disagree with that. This starts when I finished my first year of college in the Bay Area. I worked my ass off in school and I just wanted to have a wild summer and I would do anything I could to get out of the house. My cousin was, and is, my best friend, and we basically did anything and everything together. When there wasn't anything to do, we'd take walks together around my rural neighborhood. I always lived near this old hospital, which used to operate as the biggest trauma unit in my area. Sometime when I was in high school, they shut the hospital down for some reason that I still don't know. It basically just sat there rotting for a few years before we found it. One day, we were drinking a cold one and taking one of our routine walks and ventured away from our usual route through this peaceful, random field. We stumbled across this huge parking lot after making it out of the field, but it didn't hit me that this was the old hospital's parking lot that we had found. We made our way through the lot until we saw this massive building standing on the outside. The deteriorated banner said emergency room, and this was when we knew we had struck gold and stumbled across a back route to this abandoned hospital. We knew of this place, but we had never been here. We hadn't heard any weird, outlandish urban legends, nor had anyone that we knew been here before us. We pushed forward and checked out the perimeter. To our surprise, the first door we walked up to had a rock jammed in between the door frames so that we could just waltz right in. This was when it occurred to us that it could be a potentially bad idea if we got caught and we could suffer some consequences. We agreed we would be quiet and respectful and make it a quick trip. This is where things take a turn. Or a few turns. We entered the building and it was the most deafening quiet that I had ever experienced. The sound of the door closing was like a literal bomb going off. Once the echo stopped from the door, it dawned on us that this place was straight up creepy. We walked slowly, but the floor is covered in glass, which makes even the smallest of steps sound like Bigfoot lumbering around a library. We found a patient room, which still had a bed inside. We stopped at the doorway to look in, because the floor looked sketchy. Out of nowhere, from around the corner, we heard the faintest, slow, drawn-out whistling. I've never in my life stopped what I was doing so suddenly. I just stared wide-eyed at my cousin, because even a whisper sounds like yelling in this place. We both have our feet planted to the ground, because if we move, then we too will make ourselves known. At this point, we both assumed there could potentially be a squatter or a guard of some sort. 
My cousin Han gestures to me that we have to leave and we can't just stand here because the whistling was obviously not going to stop. We turn toward the opposite of the corner that the whistling is at, and we're tiptoeing to a perfect science. Then the whistling stopped. We freeze again, and we hear the glass crunching from around the corner. We start running. Once we get to the door we came from, we realize we didn't put a fucking rock in the door frame when we came in, and now the door is completely stuck. As we were trying to get this door open, the glass crunching is now running. We hear it until it sounds like it is dangerously close. I am horrified. We turn around to try another door and the noise of the glass is literally right in front of us. Yet no one is there. No one. We book it to a door that says pharmacy and peel the door open. The pharmacy is completely empty except a single perfectly placed and aligned landline phone plugged into the wall. The phone is off the hook and making a dial tone. The whole thing is so perfectly lined up and centered with the whole room, I've never seen anything like it. And the dial tone was so loud in such an empty place. There wasn't power throughout the hospital, so how was it working? I was in complete shock. We left and never went back. I had heard of some other kids going there at night. They told me that they also heard the whistling and thought someone was lurking in the shadows the whole time. It is a freaky world out there. I am a 19-year-old female. When I was eight, right around Valentine's Day, I received one of those small manila envelopes in the mail. It had no return address, but it was sent from another state where I didn't know anyone from. When I opened it, it was simply a folded sheet of computer paper with a picture of Linus from Charlie Brown holding a heart and his blanket. It appeared to be drawn and colored by hand. On the inside was a short Valentine's Day message with a small personal detail about my life that only someone close to me would know. Naturally, I thought it was probably my grandparents or my parents trying to do something nice for me. Every year, it had a picture of Linus, included a detail about my life, was typed in the same font, and was from a different state. For example, the Valentine's Day after I adopted my dog, Bailey, the card said, Would Bailey be jealous if you were my Valentine? I kept most of these, and managed to find a few as I was rummaging through old, worthless junk. When I got older, I finally mentioned it to my grandparents, fully expecting it to be them, but they swore that they weren't the ones sending the cards. I honestly believe it, because I had expressed my concerns by this point, and they aren't the type that want to scare me. Neither are my parents. The only other family I have in the US are my dad's parents who don't speak English well and have never owned a computer. They had immigrated here and there was no way for them to know people in so many states. Aside from my parents and my brother who found it strange as well, I have no other family. I still get these cards every year, always the same except for one Valentine's Day a few years ago. I received a stuffed teddy bear and a big chocolate heart along with the card. Needless to say, I did not eat the chocolate and I searched that bear half convinced that there would be a hidden camera. After that year, I started just receiving the cards again. In any case, as a child, it was sort of exciting and mysterious, like a secret admirer. Now, it's just unnerving. I have racked my brain for years trying to find out who it could possibly be, and I have come up empty-handed. It still makes me uneasy, but if this person wanted to hurt me, I think that they would have done it by now. I've never felt outwardly threatened by them, so I don't think there's much that I can do about it. I live in Oklahoma, and I'm really big into finding abandoned places and exploring them. 
I found out a few months ago that there is a forgotten graveyard a few minutes away from my house. I've lived in Oklahoma my whole life, and I've never even heard anyone mention this place before. So I looked it up and did more research on it to make sure that I wasn't walking into something crazy or where I could possibly be harmed. I found out that it was the site of an old schoolhouse, and that there was no marker, so people had basically just forgotten that it was even there over the years unless they had a loved one that was buried there. I waited until daylight to go, just in case, because I wanted to be able to see everything around me since I was in the middle of nowhere. I ended up asking my sister if she wanted to go with me so that I wouldn't be alone. And God, am I glad that I asked her to come because I never thought I would have saw what I did. We woke early the next morning to go before it got hot because it was summertime. It was ten minutes away from the house, so it was an easy drive. Finding the exact location was the hard part. Once we did find it, we pulled up and got out and started to look around. The grass was all overgrown, and you couldn't really see any of the headstones anymore. We had to be super careful walking around because we didn't want to step on anyone. We explored for about an hour or so, and then we stumbled upon this opening where the old schoolhouse used to be. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it sounded like someone or something was running right at us. But there was no one else around. And mind you, again, we're in the middle of nowhere. So we stop what we're doing and back up a bit to look and see. Neither of us spook easy, so we just looked around and we didn't see anything. We decided it was getting too hot to just stand out there for much longer, and so we started walking back to the car. Again, it sounded like something or someone was running at us, but faster this time. We both took off sprinting to the car and didn't stop until we got in and locked the doors. As we sat there, I looked up more about this place, and it's known by a few people to have major activity, and it's so bad that they actually tell you not to go at night time. I read stories of people who said they had seen figures walking around, or someone asking them for help and then disappearing a few minutes later. I'm glad that I decided to wait until daylight, and that I asked my sister to come with me, because I don't know what I would have done if I heard someone that I couldn't even see running at me if I were alone. I've never been back to this graveyard. It actually kind of scares me to even think about going back after what happened when, though it wasn't anything serious like some of the other stuff people had said happened to them, maybe one day I'll have the guts to return. This is the only time I have ever had a threatening contact or experience. In June of 2019, me and a friend had decided to go with our girlfriends on a camping trip. It's the day of, and we're packing all of our things into the car. We finally get everything loaded and get into the car and put the address in the GPS. We set off, and after three hours of driving and 45 minutes of hearing my friend and his girl argue, we finally arrive. We get out of the car, and me and my friend begin to unload. After getting my stuff, I begin to gather my girlfriend's things. As I was, my friend was asking his girlfriend why she needed three bags for a one-night camping trip. She smiled and opened one of them, which contained an ounce of pot and other paraphernalia. The other two bags had her favorite snacks and clothes. Now knowing that we had weed, we had to find a place to camp that wasn't near any other people. It took until sundown, but we discovered the perfect spot. We decided that after we got everything taken care of, we would eat hot dogs and smoke. We started to build a campfire to light the area so that we could set up our tents, but ran out of wood immediately. I said that I would go get some while my friend stayed with the girls. I set off on my journey, and after about two minutes, I find some sticks to use. I start picking them up, and all of a sudden, I felt someone grab my wrist. I looked up to see a very pale, strange-looking man wearing a blank expression. For a man, he also had surprisingly long fingernails. He was digging them into my wrist while trying to grab my other wrist. 
I turned my head to not see his face and screamed for help, and my friends shouted a response, saying that they were coming. After they shouted, I immediately felt relief in my wrist. I wasn't struggling to keep my arms down, so I turned. I turned and ran as fast as I could. Horrified. I met up with my friends and said that we had to leave immediately. I didn't even bother to explain myself. I just wanted gone. We loaded back up and took the long walk back. We get to the car and load our bags into it. I explained what happened as we were walking back and it scared them enough to make them want to hustle. I had a picture of my wrist right after, but my iPhone broke and my cloud wasn't backed up, so I lost it. I do have a picture of it now, though. It has since then become a scar, which shows just how much force he was using. It was absolutely terrifying. My fiancé first encountered this thing in 2013. He and his friends were on a camping trip up in the woods in Maine. Middle of nowhere, literally. No houses, nothing for miles. They had a small fire going, but due to the rain it was hard to keep it going. They kept hearing something trying to creep up on them. It was kind of noisy and sounded big, but was only on two feet. They started throwing rocks in the direction where they heard the footsteps coming from, and suddenly this thing let out a blood-curdling scream. Nothing any of them had ever heard before. He describes it as something that sounds like a fox, but slightly more human. It went crashing through the woods super clumsily, but kept trying to come back. They had to fend it off for most of the night. The second encounter was about a year and a half later. He was out on a solo camping trip in Vermont since that was something that he enjoyed. He heard the exact same blood-curdling scream that he had heard the first time. He was just sitting alone in the dark, looking at the stars with no fire or anything, when suddenly he heard the scream again. He quickly packed everything up and just went home. No hesitation. The third time was tonight. He was supposed to go out to my car to grab us a couple bottles of water when he heard the voices. Due to us recently having someone coming onto our property and stealing from our landlords, he went to investigate. He calls me and tells me to let the dog out. As he was sneaking around, the voices turned into a snarling sound. He quickly stopped, turning off his flashlight, and dropped to the ground. The dog was standing next to him. Suddenly he sees two glowing eyes, and it lunges at him. The dog gets excited and starts chasing it. The whole time they're chasing it, it's screaming and running faster than our dog. Even though he was running with a flashlight, he couldn't make out a shape of its body. He says by how far apart the eyes were, it seemed kind of big. He couldn't get a shape or color besides where its body should be was a slight discoloration of the darkness around it. It kept looking back at him while he chased, and its eyes were just glowing while it screamed. Our dog chased it off into the woods but luckily she came back. I think it was trying to lure him in by making it sound like voices, but the dog scared it. He said he couldn't get a height because the eye level kept changing from squatting to standing up, and then it started running. Has anyone experienced anything like this? Or knows what this animal or supernatural thing could be? This took place a few years ago. 
I was with my best friend and we decided to go camping at a campsite in Flagstaff named Locket Meadow. We had taken our dogs. After a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I awoke in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside of our tent burying itself into our tent. It had a weird way of hovering back and forth over my body, and my dog, who was curled up awake and not moving or making a sound, was at the bottom of my feet. I look over and see my best friend passed out, and his dog, which I'm unsure if it was awake, but clearly I was the only one between my friend and I that's experiencing this terrifying encounter. I eventually covered my head and thought about anything else that might make me fall asleep. The next day, I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake through all of that. I explained what had happened. He replied no and thought that I was just making it up. I told him maybe it was a bear, so we looked around our campsite, but couldn't find anything. No trails, no prints, nothing. We also had food out on a table near our tents, and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch, so even if it was a bear, I'm really surprised that it didn't get into any of our stuff. Either way, I remember how scared shitless I was seeing this dark object observing our tent. Could it somehow have been the wind? A deer? Who knows? But this is just one encounter out of the whole trip. The next night, we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we're in Arizona. Before we wanted to settle in, we explored Sedona. We drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down by the water. We took our dogs and hiked to the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming, we dried off and were about to head out. Next thing you know, in our peripheral vision, we see a giant rock being thrown near us. It makes a huge splash in the water. We look up and don't see anything above, so we ran over stones and rocks to get a clear view of the top and still see no one. We yell out taunts and curse words, but still heard no one running off or any kind of sound in response. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up, my friend told me that throughout the trip since we started in Flagstaff, he had rocks being thrown at him, right up until that giant one at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought that maybe someone was following behind us, messing with us. Then we sort of laughed it off and said no, that was impossible, that we were just trying to connect the dots to have it be a cool look-back adventure. Well, I'm glad that it didn't turn into a part three, because nothing happened that night, or the next day, where we packed up and headed home with nothing more than a memory that we wanted to rationalize. This happened in October of 2019. So it was a weekend, and I figured it would be a good idea to get out of town for the day and introduce my girlfriend to my mom for the first time. She lives out on the plains on 40 acres. The house and land are a fourth of a mile off the road into the field, with our long driveway dividing the land of two neighbors. We arrived around noon, and my brother and his wife also happened to be out there visiting that day, so I introduced the girlfriend to everyone and the dogs. I noticed that the loudest and most obnoxious dog, the Beagle, didn't come to greet us, and my mom explained that the previous night she went to grab something from the truck, and on her way in the dog had darted out the door and ran off into the field, and still hadn't come back. This isn't all that uncommon for a dog to run off in the night and come back a couple of days later. Later that day, my mom recalls that her and my nieces were woken up around 1 a.m. to all the dogs howling and barking non-stop, just going nuts. Eventually they stop and everyone gets to go back to sleep. We continue to have a nice quiet day out in the middle of nowhere for a few more hours. When we notice that this hawk has been flying around the same spot all day in the field. So my brother and his wife go to check it out while I mess around doing something else. 
A few minutes later, my brother comes back and tells me he found the missing beagle, but something is wrong. I should go check it out before telling my mom. I follow my brother out into the field, expecting to find a dead dog. As we were walking, I see a spot of blood and think it was probably coyotes. He shows me a trail of blood that leads to a larger puddle and another trail. The dog seems to have been drug around some. The trail led to an area in the field where the dog lay. As soon as I saw the dog, something looked wrong about the scene. All the plants around him were trampled and something looked different about him. I took a few more steps and I realized that he was missing skin. This wasn't just a few bits missing from a fight or birds picking at him. The only fur or skin left on him was his head, tail, and paws with very distinguished straight lines where he had been skinned. Some sick fuck had killed skinned, and taken the pelt of our dog in the middle of the night, only a couple of hundred feet from the front door. Of course we called the cops. They took two hours to arrive. They took pictures. We looked around the area and noticed tire tracks, but we couldn't tell how old they were. We also found a pile of horse shit that looked pretty fresh close by. Did whoever did this ride a horse out there? To this day, the cops have never followed up with anything, and nothing else has happened. Nature cams were installed, and fences have been mended so dogs can't get out. But we still have no idea who did it. I came across the pictures on my phone today, and can't seem to bring myself to delete them. Before the pandemic, I was visiting West Canada, just exploring caves, when I'm pretty deep inside of one, perhaps 70 meters in. I get to this pretty tall section of cavern, and then I hear it, a scuffling noise. I put it off, thinking that it was just some rocks moving. I turn off my headlamp, and then I see them. These two glowing eyes. Glowing yellow eyes. So I turned my lamp on again, and what I saw this time was terrible. There was this grayish thing. It looked humanoid, but its arms and legs were too long and splayed out weirdly. Its claws were long and they looked like they could easily slice through Kevlar. Its teeth were long as well. Its skin was super tight around its ribs and spine. I could see its bones. It screeched a horrible noise. I had to cover my ears. I look back, and it's gone. But I hear this low growl. Well... I felt it more than I heard it. So I start slowly heading back, and it starts moving toward me. So I start running. Pretty close to the exit, I could see the sunset. I felt its breath on me. As soon as I reached the exit, though, it pulled back. Bystanders said they saw it too, that it ran away like lightning. I'm never going to those caves again. I can't get this experience out of my head, no matter how many years have passed. This happened way back in the early 2000s. I was in the 8th grade and we were on a trip. I stayed in a hotel with two other girls, 
One of them was my friend and another girl who we were just somewhat acquainted with. The first night in the room, during my shower, I felt like someone was behind me. Like standing really close to my back under the shower spray. I turned around quickly, but no one was there. So I continued showering, but the feeling just got worse. When I finished my shower, I pulled open the curtain, and when I looked up at the gigantic wall mirror, I saw a grotesque face behind my right shoulder. It was gone within seconds. I think I stood frozen there for a whole minute before I practically ran out, screaming. The next day, we were getting ready to go out. The girl we roomed with said that someone was in our room last night. She heard the toilet flush, the sink turn on, but then nothing. No one entered the room. No one left. And no one else but us was in there to begin with. We know because we checked every nook and cranny after she told us. The second night, when we got back to our hotel room, I suddenly felt super sleepy, like I literally fell to the floor once I stepped inside. It was odd because I wasn't sleepy at all until we actually walked into the room. The other two couldn't move me since I had an extra 50 pounds on them, so they just covered me up with the blanket, put a pillow under my head, and left me there. Then my friend said that sometime during the night I had gotten up, used the bathroom, and crawled into the bed. But I don't remember doing that. In fact, when I woke up on the third day, I was still on the floor. I'm employed as a policeman, and I work the night shift in a tiny little town. The population here barely breaks a thousand. Needless to say, I know the town well enough to be able to tell when something is wrong. Near the center of the town, there's the old school they used before they built the new elementary and high schools. The building is listed as a historical site and can't be demolished, but due to asbestos, renovations would cost the town too much to be worth the work. This school sits within feet of the public library, and behind it sits the town's fairground. It isn't an official fairground, but every year they had bull riding and small shows that they would put on for kids during the summer. With all of those details out of the way, I will explain what happened. I noticed the backlight to the library on, which is not normal since it wasn't on all night, and it isn't a motion light, so I parked on the north side of the old school grounds. I walked through the fence and had to pass the school to get to the library. I would stop every few feet and listen because the gravel was so loud. When I stopped the second or third time, I thought I heard a squeal in the school, like the sound of a door. At first, I didn't think anything of it, since I figured I was hearing things. The town just replaced all the windows on this building, so I thought I wouldn't be able to hear the inside. When I investigated the light and found all the doors locked, I started walking back around to my car. As I passed by the school again, I heard a noise in the building again, and I stopped and listened. And as I shined my light, I noticed a basement window was broken out. So when I walked up to the window, I looked down and in, and didn't see anything. I kept walking, and I heard the squeal again. It reminded me of those bathroom doors in schools that the hinges always squealed really loud and echoed. When I came around the corner, I saw two cats roughhousing in the dirt. They stopped to watch me, and then both of them turned and looked at the door. I couldn't see for myself, because it was around another corner. One hissed, and they both bolted away from the school, which put me on edge. I know this school is absolutely not in use, nor are there any plans to use this school anytime soon. Also, the local kids and homeless don't come here, ever. It's a landmark the city as a whole really admires, and there hasn't ever been an issue with breaking and entering, at least not for a long time. So when I came around the corner, I saw the door and I walked up to it to see what the cats had run from. I looked for other animals, but that didn't make sense because they looked up as if someone were standing in the window of the door, 
Not like they would if it were a raccoon or a dog that ran off without me seeing. When I looked in the window with my light, I could see a gigantic raggedy Ann painted on the wall, and I assumed this was the kindergarten section or something. And then I stepped back from the door getting ready to leave, and I heard whistling. It wasn't really loud, but it was loud enough to make me stop. That little voice in the back of my head was talking now and telling me I was just hearing things, but the dude that likes the dump of fear of the unknown told me to go back to the door. So I went back and listened again, and I know it was whistling, and not like the squeak of an animal or an object from inside. It got louder when I came to the door again, and it had a tune, but I don't know how to describe it. So now thinking someone is in the school, I went around and checked all the doors, including the second floor door that I had to climb the rusty metal stairs that were more like a death trap to see in through. When I couldn't find a way into the school, I checked it all over again, and when I left, I couldn't figure out what it was. The whistling had stopped, and I even hung around outside for a few minutes without my light on, just watching, figuring out if someone was in there. They would eventually need to use a light to get around or to get back out, but there was nothing after twenty or so minutes. So I got in my car, circled the block, and parked down the way with my lights off to watch for someone to come out at some point. But no one did, and there haven't been any lights on. I know this story seems kind of boring compared to the others, but working nights gets you on edge. And for all the things I know I experienced before, this was in my top five bone-chilling moments while on the job. Lately, I've been dreaming about pretty weird stuff. I can't remember everything, of course, but I'm going to try to explain it to the best of my ability. About one week ago, I started dreaming more often and I could remember them clearly when I woke up. But after about two days, some inconsistencies popped up. At the end of the dream, I would start hearing weird noises. This, of course, didn't bother me until two days ago when I woke up very early, about six in the morning, and the sound was still there. I jumped out of bed and turned on the lights and noticed that my window cover, a sliding cover since my roof is slanted, was pretty much wide open. My window is right under a street light, so I always close it because I need complete darkness to sleep. When I jumped up and turned on the lights in my room, the sound immediately stopped. It's hard to explain the noise, but it sounded like the flapping of a piece of clothing against the window. I'm pretty sure that it shouldn't have happened because that's my only window, and there is never any draft in my room. I decided to just go downstairs and forget about it since I was probably still just half asleep. This is where it got weird. I have a little decorative Captain America shield on the desk in my room, which is next to the door. This is important. I started dreaming normally, superpowers and stuff until I somehow made it back to my home in my dream. And in my dream, I sat down behind my desk with the door open. When I look out of the door from my desk, I see the closet doors from across the hall. In my dream, I remember that I started to fall asleep behind my desk, and I could see out of the corner of my eye that the closet door started to open. When I looked up and blinked, it was all normal again. This happened once more. But the third time I looked up, and the closet door kept opening. So I got scared and threw the Captain America shield at the closet door. In my dream, not in real life as far as I know. And then I jumped out of my bed, scared. When I turned the lights on at, again, six in the morning, the shield was gone and lying on the floor next to me. I was very sure that that shield had been on my desk when I went to sleep. This story took place during my childhood, when I was about 12 years old. A few days ago I thought about it, and still don't know exactly what it was, and what I should think. 
It's not the most spectacular story, but anyway. I grew up in an apartment that was pretty outside the city and close to a forest. We had a lot of greenery around, and we were always playing and sometimes also camping outside with friends during the summer. So one night, me and two friends decided to build my tent and sleep outside. We were always then staying up really long and telling ghost stories. While we did this, we suddenly heard noises from outside the tent. We were all holding our breath. Then we could hear steps. They came closer and closer, and then the steps even went around our tent before stopping. We got really scared and said, Whoever you are, go away or we will call the police. It seemed to work because the steps continued and headed away from our tent. After a minute or so, we then tried to be brave and go outside the tent to see who it might have been. Then, when we looked out, we saw a woman, dressed in a long, white gown, walking away in the dark. I still don't know who or what she was, but it continues to give me chills. Let me start this off by saying that it is imperative that you stay off of the deep web. No matter what anyone tells you, no good can come from using it, and I am about to inform you as to why. I was 15 at the time. I had come home from school on a Friday afternoon ready to relax, kick back, and enjoy the short break. I had started using code about a year prior. Nothing too fancy, just basic Python, Java, HTTP, etc and was practicing it daily. Now, I had known about the dark web before this took place. I would sometimes buy weed off of it, but that was about the extent. This particular day, however, I decided to venture further and really take a look at the dark web. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the iceberg diagram representing the internet's content. For those who don't know, the surface web contains about 10% of the internet's content, while the deep and dark web take up over 90%. I was ready to see what it really held. I heard stories about what goes down on the deep web, murder, inhumane torture, etc. But I didn't really believe that they were all legit, so I hopped on tour and began to see what I could dig up. I started off by going on the hidden wiki and browsing through various websites, most of which contained illegal things such as drugs, hackers, and hitmen for hire, and lots of CP. I clicked on a random forum link, which took about a minute to load. I wish I could remember the name of it. It was a forum where people could pick a topic that they wanted to talk about, such as politics, dealing with mental health, etc. I noticed one of the topics was a pedo forum, and I don't want to even go into detail on what I saw there. There was one particular one that caught my eye. The link was all in red, while the rest were all black. It said, not for the weak, enter at your own risk. Curious as to what this was, I click on the link and it brought me to a forum that had only one other link on the whole page. I clicked that link and it brought me into a chat room. I realized that nobody was saying anything in it, only sending links. This set off alarm bells in my head because I had an idea of what was on those links. I wish that I had listened to my gut feeling, which was telling me to close out while you still can. However, the ignorant, curious teen took over me, and I started setting up some protection for myself using the code that I had learned. I later realized that this amateur coding I did would not protect me from these advanced people with malicious intent. I clicked on a random link, and a page loaded surprisingly fast. It looked to be another chat room. I went to type hello or something, but it wouldn't let me. I sighed and began moving my mouse to go to the previous page when a noise went off. I had received a chat. The message said, Hello, new user. I see you have found my site. Would you like to continue? I tried typing again, but I still couldn't. The next message sent chills down my back, and my hands were shaking. It read, No, son. Not the keyboard. 
I tried turning off my computer, of course, but nothing worked. Another message popped up saying, I guess I'll take that as a no. The screen suddenly changed, and a video began playing. It was a black screen, but I could hear a deep male voice say, Unfortunately for you, you do not have a choice. I grabbed a sticky note and put it over my webcam and the voice on the screen said, Ah, so we're playing games now, huh? The video then began to change, and I realized the man was taking his hand off the camera. He was a short man, maybe 5'7 tops, but that brought me no comfort. He held up a knife and said, Name any body part. I then for the first time noticed a cloth in the corner of the room, covering up something which I could only assume to be a body. I had had enough. I unplugged my computer and lay on the floor panting for hours until I could finally get up. I now suffer from anxiety and won't touch a computer unless I absolutely have to. This happened to me back in 2008 when I was 14, so my memory is a little fuzzy. My mom, brother, and I drove deep into the sticks of Tennessee from Texas to visit. We were only staying for the weekend. My mom, aunt, and grandmother were talking, and I don't know how we got to this conversation, but my aunt was telling me how she heard about this abandoned church that was supposedly haunted. If you went to the church and took the stick that kept the door closed and put it somewhere else, when you came back, it would be in its original place. There was a statue of an angel, and if you shined a light in its eyes at night, they would bleed. She was spending the night at a friend's house, and her friend also had another friend over that she wasn't familiar with. Her two friends decided to go out to this church at night, in the early hours of the morning. It was pitch black because it's out in the country. They lay a Ouija board on the truck and start asking questions. Basically, some spirit named John says that he was murdered by a gunshot some year in the early 1800s. I swear in this town there are more dead people than there are alive people. I don't actually know that, but it sure seems like it. The last question that they asked was, where are you? and the planchette flew off the board. They decided they didn't want to look for it. Part of me wonders if it's still at the church and where it would be. So they checked the gravestones nearby and found John. Then they thought that they heard a gunshot and ran back to the truck and went home. I said I wanted to go to the church. She took me, my brother, and my cousin who were the same age it was about a 45-minute drive to get there, and the road that it was on was empty, nothing but grass. There was no way that you could walk there. Across the street was a field that went on for miles, and on either side of the church was just grass and trees. No street lights. So when we get there, it's a one-room, white, little church. It's surrounded by trees toward the outside of the fence. The fence was black iron, and the opening was big enough for trucks to come through. We saw the creepy angel statue that my aunt had mentioned. We thought it looked like the Reaper. We pull up, and the gate is already open. Immediately, my brother and my cousin, who were in the back seat, were like, Oh no, we are not going in there. And my aunt was saying, Why is the gate open? I just don't understand. And I had my hand on the handle, and I looked at the gate and I knew that something was waiting for me on the other side. I could see, maybe my mind made it up, but I didn't see it with my physical eyes, a ghostly white man with yellow crooked teeth maliciously smiling at me. So I take my hand off the handle and say, okay, I want to go home. So my aunt backed out and went down the road a little bit further and the closest thing next to us to turn around at because there were little ditches on the side of the road in case it rains, was another graveyard. Not surprising. We passed by the church, and I wasn't expecting her to stop, 
but she did to take a photo with a digital camera, and the door was open to the church. We were all freaked out, and I swear I had this feeling like we needed to leave because something was going to chase us. When we got home, the three of us couldn't stop looking at the camera. The thing I remembered the most was that the treetops grew into a face. It looked like a big bald man with a crooked nose and a narrow chin. When my aunt got the picture developed, there were four orbs. One by the gate, one by the door, and two by the window. My brother and cousin swore that they had seen green eyes looking out of that window. I didn't sleep that night. I felt like something was hovering over me, waiting for me to fall asleep. I kept praying that nothing would happen. I tried watching TV to shake it off, but damn, there was no shaking it. I didn't sleep until I got back to Texas. That was my last night in Tennessee, and when I went back home, I slept with my light on every night for a while. And while we were there, I could just sense this unbelievable amount of hate from whatever was there. It was so aggressive and ready to attack. That feeling just pierced through you. That's my only experience. I will never doubt that there is a spirit world after that. My aunt sent me the picture, but I tore it up in 2012 because I was afraid that it would bring something bad into the house. My boyfriend and I decided to take an impromptu trip to Gettysburg and booked a decently priced hotel the night before. The first night I fell asleep no problem, but the second night, not so much. He had already gone to bed, and I had just shut the light off. As soon as the light was out, I could hear paper or bags shuffling around on our TV stand, and I thought that he had gotten up to look for something. I looked up, and of course no one was there, but I instantly felt terrified and felt the presence of someone standing at the foot of our bed. It only lasted about a minute or so, and then suddenly there was a loud bang, like a door being slammed in the room above us, and the feeling disappeared. When we got home, my boyfriend, who doesn't believe in the supernatural at all, extremely reluctantly brought up how the first night that we stayed, he got up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and immediately got creeped out and thought that someone was in our room. He went into the bathroom and felt like someone was standing directly behind him. Of course, Gettysburg has tons of history. But after doing some research, I haven't found much information about the hotel or what may have been there before. Whatever happened in our room didn't feel harmless, though. Before I begin my story, I'll give you a quick summary of the location where this happened. At my middle school, in the other half of the building built in the 1950s at some point. All the classrooms have little windows next to them. My reason for bringing this up is a horrifying event that took place during my fifth class today involving one of these said windows. I walked into the classroom and set my stuff down, preparing to ask the boy next to me named Cameron if he had a pencil. As I was about to open my mouth, I heard a loud smacking sound followed by a crunch, followed by a shattering type noise. Sort of like when you drop a box of pencils or markers. All of a sudden, I was deafened by screams of shock and agony. My classmates were now in the hall, shocked by something just barely out of my line of sight. I walked into the hallway with them. Being on the shorter end of the height spectrum, I had to shove my way to the front of the group. What I saw next will haunt my dreams for the rest of my life. I saw a girl rolling around on the floor smearing blood on the dirty linoleum tiles. At first I couldn't tell what happened, but I got the picture after a few seconds. This girl was a special needs student. 
After being rejected by a boy in her class, she went completely ballistic and without thinking had punched one of the windows next to a neighboring classroom's door. There was broken glass and blood everywhere. Thankfully, the classroom next to ours is vacant and no one was in there at the time of the incident. After about 10 minutes, teachers got the situation calmed down. The girl was completely insane and tried to fight the man who came to help her. The school ended up going into a lockdown. She had to go to the hospital, and even though no one really knew her, we were all in legitimate shock by the horrible scene. I really hope that she's getting the help she needs, and hope that she doesn't have a fistful of glass shards. I've seen some really crazy things at my school, but that might have been the most messed up thing I've ever witnessed. I recently went bush camping with my boyfriend on Crown Land near Stone Mills, Ontario. It was our first time doing bush camping, so I sent a video of our campsite set up to a friend. Days after this happened, I talked to my friend, who asked me about the ghost in the video that I was completely unaware of since I didn't take a second look at it after sending. When I had that closer look, I zoomed in to see a terrifying skeleton-like figure. At first, I thought it was a glare on the lens from the fire, but the figure is moving way quicker than the speed of the camera. This place was very deserted, but throughout the night, I heard clear footsteps that sounded human. So much so that I thought that the cops had come to kick us out when I saw a flashlight point at us from the woods. I quickly pointed my light back, but never saw any animals or people. I have been camping a lot and have had deer, squirrels, and raccoons come to my campsite and their footsteps did not sound like the ones that I had heard. I'm not a believer of the paranormal or anything of the sort, so I didn't even think about it until watching the actual footage. My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520 and found a cool abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long abandoned bridge. If you've ever been in the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere over it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was no one within at least three miles of us and we had to hike our way in, approximately a tenth of a mile from where we had parked. We explored around the area for a bit and didn't come across anything out of the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name, Mona, written in ash on a rock of the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river and snapped my head up, but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention and watched a ball of light float, even with the bridge 40 feet in the air, from one side to the other in the woods over 50 feet. The light was very blue. My thought at first had been somehow that headlights had come through but I would have heard a car and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. This blue light was unlike anything I had ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge 30 feet away and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot off into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of someone's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as quickly as any human could go, and we saw nothing attached. Our dog left the tent and stared at that exact spot for the next 10 plus minutes, while also peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously.
My parents live on about 30 acres of wooded land in the middle of nowhere. I was in high school at this time and was up late on a weekend. I remember that I had fallen asleep in the recliner in our living room and woke up at around 2 a.m. I sat up and watched TV for about half an hour and then got up to get some water before going to bed. Our kitchen sink looked out over our backyard, and I could see clear to the tree line because of a lamp on a telephone pole that we had installed for security. As I looked out, I saw something dash across the tree line for about 50 feet before going back into the trees. I can still see it in my mind. It was either a white or really pale gray, and looked like a person moving on all fours. There was no visible fur or clothing. I could tell it was large, at least the size of a person, maybe larger. It covered the 50-foot span in between 5 and 10 seconds. I was absolutely frozen in place for a solid minute after this encounter. My parents kept telling me that it was just an albino coyote. I know it wasn't. A few years later, I came across a YouTube video talking about really strange creatures caught on trail cameras. It was one of those low-quality edits that pop up on your recommended videos after a long video binge. Halfway through came an image that made my blood go cold. It was called a rake. This was exactly what I had seen. To this day, I will swear by it that I saw this creature and still refuse to be outside at night at my parents' house. I went camping on a hiking trail in the Shawnee State Forest. During the day, I set up camp and went fishing in a creek running along next to the campsites. Most of the day, I felt fine and peaceful. I tend to feel at home in the woods alone and fly fishing. I started a fire, started on dinner over the fire before it got dark, and stoked the fire. Once it got dark, I felt compelled to keep the fire stoked, and a feeling of panic would set in if it even began to die down. I couldn't relax. I was constantly looking over my shoulder. It got to the point where I just grabbed my light and walked out, leaving all of my stuff there. I got out to the parking lot about a mile and a half away and tried to steal my nerves and go back, but couldn't step past the tree line. I waited all the way until morning to go back to get my stuff, and the feeling was gone. I got everything together and left. Haven't been back since. I don't know if it was a ghost or a native spirit since this place is deep in what used to be Shawnee tribe land. This took place in the summer of 2010. I was with my family and we went down to the USA for vacation that year. We stayed at the hotel we normally stayed at, which was a Red Roof Inn. As we walked in, something felt off about the room, and I thought to myself that it must be just nothing. Over the next few nights, always around three in the morning, my mother and I would hear a knocking against the wall. At first we thought, oh, maybe it's just the people next door. However, the room was empty, and we thought nothing of it until it kept happening. I was wondering, could it possibly be haunted? My mother, being super into the paranormal and believing in this as I do myself, we decided to take a statue of the Archangel Michael from my dad's dashboard. It was super small, nothing big, and the next thing you know, we never heard the knocking for the rest of the trip. So it is possible that the room was haunted, and after doing some reading, we think that it could have been a poltergeist. I 
I was in a nearby abandoned Navy hospital with several friends. We had been in many times before and never had anything odd happen. We were on the top, the third floor, and there were many broken windows, allowing the rain and nature in. There was a lot of mold and even moss growing in the old ceiling tiles that covered the floor at this point. One of our group, prone to asthma and respiratory issues, didn't take it too well. We all decided it was best to leave and began our descent into the basement, which was the route to the exit. This is when things got weird. I broke ahead of the group, something generally against our rules of exploring, but in my mind I had to get out. I was far enough ahead, around corners and such, that I couldn't even see their flashlights behind me anymore. My heart was racing, and I still don't know why. I finally got to the last door that led to the room that we would exit from. It was a heavier door that closed by itself. I reached for the doorknob, but something stopped me. I couldn't do it. Something in my mind wasn't letting me put my hand on the knob. All I felt was terror. I'm not sure how long I stood there, shaking with my hand no more than three inches away, before I saw the flashlights of my friends at the end of the hallway, and at last, I could do it. I wrenched the door open and immediately went outside, hyperventilating with panic. My friends soon joined me, also saying something felt a little weird in there that time. We were gathering outside the door when the friend with the breathing issues felt something on her shoulder. We pulled down her shirt and there was a noticeable, quite obvious, handprint. Nobody touched her, especially not hard enough to leave a full handprint through clothing. We've been back several times and haven't had another experience in any way, which only makes it even more odd, if you ask me. It is not uncommon for me to have dreams about shadow people or to have sleep paralysis. On this particular night, I had a dream about a red marble and that an entity was tied to this said marble. I felt that I had to protect this marble and keep it away from people who were trying to get it. The marble bounced out of my hand and I told the entity to roll it back to me, which it did. Here is the weird part. I remember in my dream picking up the marble, but all of a sudden I was staring up at the ceiling. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see a shadow person approaching, and it started to lean over me, looking down. At this point, I have no idea if I'm awake or if I'm dreaming, but I remember saying over and over again, leave, 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 leave. But the voice started to sound deeper and deeper and not like mine at all. My boyfriend sleeping next to me shook me awake, and I sat up calmed down, and went back to sleep. In the morning, I asked what had happened, and he said that I was talking in my sleep and that I had said a sentence that was all jumbled so he couldn't make out what I was actually saying. This made me feel weird, because if I did sleep talk, I would have thought it would have been one word, over and over. I remember in my dream feeling uneasy and scared. Does this sound like I was visited? Or was it just a really bad case? of sleep paralysis. Edit. I also forgot to mention that I told my mom about the dream and what time that it had happened. And she said that she had had a terrible dream and woke up screaming around that same time. We sleep on different floors, so I didn't hear her do this, but she doesn't remember her dream. My dad used to work at a homeless shelter. He usually helped them find jobs and things like that. When I had to go with him, they left me in a room with a bunch of Disney VHS movies with some printout coloring pages and a bunch of colored pencils. So a lot of these people were drug addicts or recovering that or schizophrenic. 
I was there because my dad left something there, but I wanted to go to my room, which the nice lady called the room. My dad was talking to this woman outside the door, which was closed. Then the door locks. All I could hear was screaming and crying outside. The knob shook, and I walked over to unlock the door, but my gut told me that if I did, it would not be good. So then a guy began to bang on the door, screaming for me and calling me baby girl. I didn't know what to do when I heard a very loud gunshot, followed by my dad screaming for them to stop shooting due to me being behind the door. He stabbed the woman who had used her keys to lock me in that room, and she did not make it. I was okay, but in the end I just remember a very nice cop opening the door and covering my eyes while they took me outside to an ambulance. R.I.P. Miss Rose, and thank you for saving my life. I am eternally grateful. Homeless man, let's not meet again. About a year or two ago, I was in my room sleeping. I was on my side facing the wall with the closet in it. I don't even remember waking up. I was just all of a sudden propped up on one arm, still on my side, staring at the closet. I couldn't move either during this event. So as I was stuck staring at the closet, the closet door began to open and I heard whispering coming out from within. I couldn't make out whatever was being said, but when the door was open almost fully, I saw a light, grayish, off-white humanoid figure standing in the doorway. I still couldn't move, and then just like that, the figure was gone. The closet door shut, and I was wide awake, laying on my side without any memory of lying back down. It's important, I think, to note that I never felt any fear during this event. I didn't have any kind of emotional response at all. I was just watching what was happening. Any explanations for what it could be, paranormal or not, is appreciated. Also, I've never experienced any kind of sleep paralysis before this or after, and this has never happened again. I am on an extended stay at a hotel away from my home for military reasons. The first two weeks were fine, but now I've been waking up between 4 and 5 a.m. every night, feeling like someone is watching me from one specific side of the room. Last night it started around 10 p.m. and nearly kept me up all night. I only feel this at my hotel room. Not when I go home on my off-duty days. I live on the second floor, so it can't be coming from the window. It is only one specific side of the room, which is a little unsettling. Last night it got so intense that what little sleep that I did get was with the light on. I have a history of sleep paralysis and other sleep issues, but this is something that I have never felt before. I have had multiple experiences with the unexplained and paranormal side of things, but this just seems different. Could this be my own paranoia? So basically, me and my friend were messing around until he informed me about a part of the web so messed up and dangerous that it's illegal. I kinda thought he was bluffing, but asked to see anyway. I can't remember how he got there, but somehow he did, because he said he went on there for laughs and gags. When we got on there, everything seemed normal, until he started to see things with titles like military grade lasers or military grade integral silencers. As we got further in, we started seeing more things like drugs and, of course, more illegal weapons. We finally just quickly scrolled through stuff since we didn't really see anything that piqued our interest. 
till we came across a website or something titled Daycare for Kids. When we clicked on it, we saw what looked to be a room covered in feces and blood with a caged mic in the middle. We got so scared, we closed out of the browsers as fast as possible and never went back. I spent the weekend camping throughout the Northeast, and all was very normal and quite nice. However, last night I camped in Massachusetts in a wooded area between Providence and Plymouth. Nothing felt negative, but I saw lights at least three times. The last time was just minutes ago, and that's what prompted me to write this. The lights are very quick, and almost out of the corner of my eye. I don't know what to say or quite how to describe it. I've never seen anything like it. And if it was paranormal, and if it was paranormal, it was very clear. However, each time, they disappeared the second that I looked directly at them.